Our story begins with a mysterious question from the system. Do you know how this world will end? The system offers the user a choice of yes or no, as the digital page, clean as fresh snow, gently settles onto the stone floor. Next, we find ourselves in a dungeon where a secret meeting of the tribe is taking place, led by their king. One figure bows his head in front of a majestic throne guarded by orcs. The king of the dungeon swings his leg over his leg with a casual grace as he sits on his throne of power. In his hand he holds a daisy, the petals of which he deliberately tears off one by one. The demon who took over the dungeon had only good intentions. He came to this world to take the first step toward change, slowly picking off the daisy petals. Against the backdrop of burning buildings, his demonic throne stands motionless, with a girl kneeling before him. People gathered in awe to witness this performance, holding their breath as the girl began to speak. She was visibly nervous, feeling fearful and stammering, she said. Thank you, Bishop Dantilus. Drops of sweat dripped down her forehead like tears hitting the stone pavement as she bowed before the bishop. With humble courage, she shares her knowledge of the existence of six other cities besides theirs that were last free, noting that it would take a lot of time and resources for the bishop to conquer them. The girl's words upset the bishop a bit, and the realization of the enormous effort required to suppress these cities becomes apparent. She introduces herself as Christina a noblewoman with considerable influence in the empire, assuring him that she can ensure the city's surrender without bloodshed, showing confidence in her words. The bishop, unperturbed, continues to tear off the daisy petals, deciding to give Christina a chance to prove her worth. Christina's face lights up with the realization that her words have made an impression on the bishop. She is already plotting how to convince him of her intentions, standing up with dignity. She asks the bishop for permission to mediate in negotiations with other cities. But when the last petal of the daisy falls, the bishop warns her, suspecting her of possible betrayal. His words about the betrayal of her entire people deeply upset the girl. The bishop does not back down, continuing to look her straight in the eye and expose her true intentions, which, in his opinion, are precisely treason. Feeling the weight of the bishop's words, the girl was panicked and wanted to retract her words, hoping that everything would turn out to be a mistake. But it was too late. The orcs immediately grabbed her arms, and the bishop coldly said that if her intention was to save her own skin, it was her fatal mistake, because she should have been thinking about saving her people. Isn't that true? He asked the crowd, which was watching with intense attention and holding its breath. Standing up, the bishop asked the people if they had heard the words of their so-called leader. He claimed that their leader had said that their lives, their safety, even their children, were valued less than Christina's life, which deeply disturbed the crowd. The Lord continued his speech, emphasizing whether they could really entrust their city to such an unworthy leader. He called on the people to respond to this situation, while Christina listened to his words, terrified. The bishop raised his hand and assured the people that this person did not deserve their trust. She cannot be your leader, he said loudly, addressing everyone present. He declared that he would personally be at the forefront of the fight against this hypocritical woman who thought only of herself, and promised that there were many such people in their world and he would find each and every one of them. The people listened to his words in awe, some even crying, deeply moved by his speech. His speech radiated determination and purpose, and he called for the eradication of all this corruption, inviting people to stand side by side with him in the struggle. The people enthusiastically raised their hands and shouted his name, Dantilus, showing their support and willingness to stand by his side. Surrounded by orcs, the girl with her hands in chains is led to the place of her punishment, in a fit of horror. She realizes that she has been brought to the guillotine, where a huge blade can end her life. With tears in her eyes, she begs the bishop to reconsider his decision and stop the execution, claiming that she meant no harm. But it was too late. The orc lifts her up by her hair, showing the girl's face to the crowd, which bursts into applause, supporting the decision of its leader. The ruler drops the daisy on the ground, rises from the throne and tramples the flower, showing his disdain for the previous symbol of his thoughts. He looks around the crowd with satisfaction, realizing that among the 72 demon lords ruling the demon world, Dantilus is only 71st. But this is only the beginning of a great strategy and a fascinating story. In a deep, dark dungeon, with water dripping from the ceiling, our hero sits there, uttering curses, one after another, without stopping swearing. He sits there, exhausted and bloody, asking himself how it happened that he ended up in this state, having lost all his strength. The story begins with his deep hatred for his father. He never liked his father, and he always dreamed of his death. And then the day comes when the father really dies, and the son stands in a suit by the urn with his father's ashes. He is looking at his father's portrait, thinking about his life. His father died of a heart attack. He was never a good person, always living a life of gangsterism. His father didn't live with his mother. 
He was used to women's attention and took advantage of their frivolity. He was also greedy and never shared his money. He did not raise his son and was never present in his life, which was always a painful problem for the boy. However, after his father's death, the boy did one good thing. He cleaned the house, throwing away all the unnecessary things. He thought that maybe his father had a premonition of his death. But as he made himself a cup of coffee, he came to the conclusion that he didn't care about these thoughts. He stuck to his opinion, considering such considerations insignificant and focusing on other things. The morning light came through the window, illuminating the room. From the window he watched people in suits hurrying to work, which to him was synonymous with hell, and he was enjoying the moment, drinking his morning coffee. He clenched his fist, feeling like a winner in the lottery of life. He called himself a Nita person who does not study, work, or do business. Who would have guessed that his old father had a secret that made him happy? There was 50 million yen in the basement, equivalent to 3.5 million dollars as of 2024. Lying on the couch, he realized that at the end of his life, his father was still a good father. Having left him this amount of money, the boy could afford anything he wanted, whether it was a house or a car. Everything was within his reach. He could even buy the hearts of girls, but money opened up endless possibilities for him, but the guy was not interested in all this material stuff. He had other ambitions. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door, and he jumped out of bed, his eyes lit up with curiosity. Opening the door, he saw a postman bringing him an order. The boy quickly took the package and ran to his room, leaving the postman with a thank you for choosing their service. He flew to his room as if on wings. He realized that now that he had enough money, he could afford to pay for his bedroom dream, which had cost him over 30 million yen. He made three promises to himself, never to work, never to have friends, and never to get married. For him, working was the epitome of horror, a huge part of unhappiness. Having friends meant being immersed in their constant problems listening to boring stories about work and daily life, which he absolutely wanted to avoid. Marriage for him meant spending half of his life on something as uncertain and burdensome as love. He recalled his father, who had married no less than twelve times and had numerous children, which only disgusted him. He was determined not to repeat his father's mistakes and live by his own rules. His real desire was to play his favorite games in peace, which was the epitome of luxury and a kind of paradise for him. Finally, he had the opportunity to fulfill his dream, to play games, equipping himself with everything he needed, from game tapes to a large TV. And just like that, two months passed without him noticing. He held the gamepad in his hands, combing his overgrown head, realizing that his dungeon attack was finally ready. It had taken him a long time, and there were piles of trash around his bed, evidence that he hadn't left his room. Now he was choosing what to play next, looking at VR games. The sudden annoying sound of a notification distracted him and he hadn't received one in a long time. A new message notification appeared on the big screen. The guy was surprised to receive this notification, because he did not expect anything like this. But who could have written to him if he didn't answer questions or accept friend requests? When he opened the message, he saw that it was from the game's developers, who expressed their gratitude for completing the dungeons. It was nice, but at the same time, he realized that a lot of time and effort had gone into developing the game. He took the thanks indifferently thinking about how many office workers had devoted themselves to creating games and recognized their efforts as a successful business because they had been able to convince him to buy many of their products. However, the message mentioned a server-based game, which piqued his interest. He began to wonder what this server game was. Clicking on the link, the system offered to choose between a beautiful and a serious girl, which seemed absurd to him. These previous questions seemed like complete nonsense to him. He decided it didn't matter and chose one of them. The next question was even stranger whether he enjoyed being beaten or hitting someone. The question seemed strange to him, but he continued to take the quiz. He noticed that the question seemed to have no end. This quiz seemed completely pointless to him. He got nervous and wished the quiz would finally end. And the last question from the system, do you know how this world will end? In the hero's opinion, this was the most absurd question he had ever heard. Reflecting on it, he realizes that in fact he has completed this worthless game and has a rough idea of its end. The next question challenged him. Could he change this ending? This question sounded so strange that it gave him chills. He was tired of endless questions that had no meaning for him. The messages seemed made up, and the next question about the amount of money made him indignant, forcing him to throw the gamepad away. He lost his trust in this cursed world, glad he hadn't succumbed to its temptations. But when he looked around, he saw a real mess in his room, and a big cockroach. The cockroach terrified the boy. He looked at the cockroach with disgust, shouting about the inadmissibility of such guests. Wanting to kill the cockroach, he accidentally pressed a button on his gamepad, and thus confirmed his readiness to change the ending of the game. At that moment, the monitor turned red. The room was filled with blinding red light that seemed endless. 
He closed his eyes from the bright rays, not understanding why they were so blinding. Suddenly everything went quiet. The guy disappeared, the screen turned off, and only the garbage and his computer remained in the room. Our hero, dumbfounded, watches his new image, wondering, what the hell is going on here? How could this even happen? He looks at his hands in amazement, unable to believe that they belong to him, that he can control them and feel everything as if in real life. Suddenly, his red eyes instinctively pick up a signal of danger. One of the treasure hunters calls out to him sharply. Get up and tell us where the treasure is! He warns, if you don't, the consequences will be much worse. Calling him a demon lord, the hunters terrify the boy. In despair, he realizes that his life is beginning. A new trial in a terrifying world where he is beaten by treasure hunters and lies in a dungeon, unable to say a word. Although these hands did not seem to be his own, and the body didn't feel like his own, the pain was so real that it left no doubt about the authenticity of what was happening. A sudden piercing pain gripped his body. He is suddenly grabbed by a stiff pain in his stomach, leaving him in despair with no idea what to do next. The treasure hunters, armed to the teeth, approach him. One of them ominously demands, Go ahead, spit on the ground, you'll regret it. For the last time, where are the treasures? One of the hunters says with a malicious smile, escalating the tension. The boy, in shock, helplessly watches what is happening around him, unable to understand the situation. One of the hunters emphasizes the alternative. If he does not tell where the treasure is, the pain will become indescribably more acute. By addressing him as Mr. Demon Lord, the hunters add to the mystique of the situation, hinting at what he has become in this world. Suffering from pain on his knees in front of them, the boy laughs ironically. What treasures? What demon lord? What are you talking about? He looks around, trying to figure out where he is. A place lit by candles, decorated with marble statues of demons and cold earthen passages. A crowd of armed men surrounds him, demanding the treasure, while he grimaces in pain and has absolutely no idea what is being asked of him. After focusing on himself for a moment, his eyes flash with red energy. He can barely breathe after the blows he has received, blood flowing from his mouth. It reminds him of a video game he was playing before he came here through an anomaly on his device's screen, though he can't realize it. Given the events, he loses track of how to act in this situation. His body is full of indescribable pain and his leg is so damaged that he can't even run. What the hell is going on here? He thinks, feeling incredible pain and losing his mind from the unfolding events. The situation was far from being in his favor, and although his hands were shaking, he realized he needed to calm down and collect his thoughts. He knows that in stressful situations, it is important to make your brain work as best it can to find a way to avoid a confrontation with these thugs. Turning to them, he says, Wait. Offering the treasure hunter's clues by talking to him, the first thing he asks is, Why do you call me the demon lord? Suddenly, one of the hunters grabs him by the demon horns that suddenly stood out on his head. Pulling him by the horn, the hunter ironically asks if he has lost his mind from the blows he has received. Looking into his eyes and seeing the tears, the hunter starts laughing out loud, calling him a crying demon horn, Dantalion. And then suddenly, after these words the boy's memories come back. They remind him of an RPG game where heroes travel the world to defeat demonic gods. The essence of the game was to save the world by fighting against numerous demon lords. The developers made the game incredibly difficult, where the player dies over and over again, and the story is so depressing that its only possible ending is the collapse of the world. Every day, our hero immersed himself in this game, winning every time, rapidly making his way through the trials. However, his playable character, one of 72 demon kings, was ranked 71st in the rankings, making him one of the weakest demon rulers in the game's universe. This particular Dantalion was easily defeated, and the game remained unfinished. He was easy prey for the players, the first enemy on their way, which made them wonder if he was here because of some kind of system glitch caused by an accidental button press due to a damn cockroach. There was no doubt that that bright flash of light was what had transported him to this reality, to the body of Dantalion, the demon lord. The question arises, how could this have become a reality? He comes to the conclusion that there is no logical explanation for this event. But whatever the case, he found himself in this critical situation, which was far from ideal. As he remained silent, he soon felt the treasure hunter preparing to punch him in the face. The blow was so powerful that it knocked Dantalion back several meters. He slid across the cold ground, kicking his legs into the air, and landed on his back. Stopping, he thought to himself, My God, how much longer can this go on? How can I get back? The treasure hunter laughs at him with undisguised pleasure, proclaiming that this is all just for his amusement. The other men behind him join in the mockery, laughing out loud. At this critical moment, Dantalion decides to gather his will and try to rectify his situation. But instead he faces a brutal beating, 
a fist hits him hard in the face. The men continue to beat him, using their legs and arms, causing serious injuries. During this ferocious beating, the boy thinks about the absurdity of the situation after he had finally freed himself from his father's tyranny and hoped for a free life. He dreamed of a peaceful and comfortable existence, but instead he was ruthlessly beaten by several men, which was far from his idea of comfort. Finding himself on the verge of death in this gloomy dungeon, he realizes the absurdity of the situation, feeling himself starting to lose consciousness. Suddenly, his consciousness moves to a white room where an unknown figure sits in the center at a desk whose face is not visible at first glance. As he tries to get a better look, he is horrified to realize that it is his own father, the man who has caused him many of his troubles. When he finds himself in front of his father, he cannot understand why he is in front of him and what makes his father laugh at such a moment. He thought that he had already suffered enough in his past life, but suddenly memories of an event that happened shortly before that pop into his mind. He remembers a minibus speeding down the road, which had previously been stolen by a man who had a grudge against his father. This was not the first such event. The kidnapping was repeated about four times. The kidnapper, looking at the boy in the rearview mirror, notes his unusual calmness for a kidnapped person. The boy, sitting in the back seat tied up with a strong rope, remained calm despite the situation. But this time he decided to accept his fate, letting the events unfold on their own and calm down internally. The kidnapper took him far outside the city to a certain house. In the garage of this house, the kidnapper put him on a chair, tied him up, and stood in front of him, watching him. As he approaches, the man warns him that if he makes any movement, he will kill him, putting a gun to his head. At this critical moment, the boy makes an internal decision to do whatever it takes to get rid of his despicable father. When the gun is at his temple, he tells the kidnapper, Shoot! The boy's attitude toward death, his willingness to accept the end, seriously worried the man with the gun. It's not every day that you hear a young man demanding action from you with such courage. Without hesitation, the boy tries to pull the trigger himself, deciding to help the bandit in his indecision. He convinces himself that if the gun turns out to be fake, he will lose. But if it is real, he will win. Freeing himself from the burden of the past, the boy waits with cold calm for the decisive moment imagining how the bullet will hit him directly in the head, which should have freed him from his despotic father. However, the bandit, extremely confused by the boy's determination, loses control and falls to the ground, realizing that he is unable to shoot the child. Eventually, the police detain the kidnapper, who feels defeated in this bet on his life. At this point, the boy begins to realize an important lesson. Anyone who stands up to the end has extraordinary endurance and strength of mind. Being in the body of a demon lord in such a difficult situation, this thought flashed through his mind when the kidnappers, standing in front of him, gave him one last chance to reveal where the treasure was. They were coming closer and closer, straining the atmosphere to the limit, under the incessant kicking, demanding to reveal his secret. The guy finds the strength to pull himself together. He realizes that he has already had the experience of dying on this day, which gives him a certain determination. Realizing that fate has challenged him, he decides that he has the right to control events according to his own scenario. The kidnappers, tired of the continuous beating, ask him again if he will reveal the location of the treasure, if he is ready to go to hell. They warn that their patience has limits, putting him under constant psychological pressure. One of them, a large man with a hammer on his shoulder, gives him an ultimatum, asking if he wants to die before they find out about the treasure. As the patience of all the participants in this drama wears thin, one of them shouts that no matter what he says, they will find the treasure anyway, so the only thing left for him is death. A bald man with a huge hammer in his hands is preparing to end this scene, intending to send the hero to eternity. But the boy holds his hand out saying, wait a minute, instantly stopping the attack. The man with the hammer freezes in place, stopped just before he strikes. Eagerly waiting, they focused their attention on him to hear what words he would say this time. For a moment he hesitated, but found the strength to say his resolute, I will do it. Clutching his own hand in his palm, he stood up, as if radiating steadfastness, and in silence promised himself to stand firm regardless of the circumstances. Come what may, I have to survive. He convinced himself, preparing for the inevitable trials. A new path opened up before him, marking a new beginning since he left his unkind father. Finally tasting freedom, he immersed himself in his favorite pastime, finding joy and fulfillment in it. However, quite unexpectedly, fate was preparing him to meet something completely unpredictable when the game mysteriously drew him into its whirlwind of events. Horrified to realize his new situation, he found himself in the heart of the game, caught up in the extremely unpleasant world of the scenario. And what was most striking was the fact that he was in the body of a demon lord whose existence was far from enviable. And now, right in front of him, 
there were adventurers in search of adventure, ready to meet him face to face. Being in a desperate situation, he realized that death was only a step away. No obstacle will stop the treasure hunters from taking his life, but he is not going to give up without a fight. Standing before the adventurers, he ironically thinks of himself as a joke of fate when, after the longed-for freedom, life throws him a new challenge. He offers the treasure hunters a deal, assuring them that he knows the location of the treasure and is ready to share this information. His eyes flashed with demonic light, promising to resolve the situation according to his own plan. He swears to himself to survive at any cost. One of the powerful treasure hunters, a bald giant, laughs, thinking that the Lord has surrendered. He is excited to be able to get the treasure quickly and bring the Lord's head to his leader as a gift. However, the Lord realizes that he doesn't actually know where the treasure is, and pointing out any location will only hasten his end. He realizes that he has to buy time to find a way out of this situation because a direct answer will be his death sentence. Despite the complete confusion of our hero, he decides not to give up and does everything he can to stay alive, even when the chances of survival seem prohibitively small. He points the treasure hunters to the Temple of the Demon Lord as the place where the treasure is, giving himself time to plan the next step in this deadly game of survival. The treasure hunters listened with intense attention as he warned them that the treasure was hidden behind a magic shield and the only chance they had was to take it with them to show them the way. While saving his life, he confidently looked them in the eye, asking what they would say. Suddenly one of them, unexpectedly for everyone, tried to strike, which provoked anxiety in our hero. One of the treasure hunters immediately shot out his sword, so that it seemed that the end was inevitable. However, the sword came down next to the hero's head, sinking into the ground, demonstrating the unsurpassed strength and determination of the seeker. The warning sounds. If he is lying, his life will be ended the moment the lie is discovered. The treasure hunters agreed to his terms, giving the hero additional time to work out a way out of the predicament. They laughed among themselves, mocking the idea of treasure in the demon lord's chamber, considering it too fantastic. But despite all their doubts, they decided to follow this cunning guide, hoping for the best. The demon lord leads them to his chamber, to discover the place with the treasures he spoke of. At the same time, he himself does not fully realize where exactly they might be. He ponders how to overcome the first obstacle to freedom, while being uncertain about his plan. The situation is taking on the appearance of a real battle, which seems to be starting right now, raising the stakes to the maximum. They can't kill him right here and now because they need him to show them the way to the treasure. One way or another, they have to get to the demon chamber through the dark and cold dungeon, which is their main goal. This gives the Lord time to think about his further actions and develop a strategy. He wonders about his next move and looks for a way out of the difficult situation he finds himself in. Passing through the dungeon, the hunters notice that the Lord is moving too slowly and decide to hurry him. One of the hunters threatens, saying that if the Lord deliberately delays them, he can kill him at any moment, without waiting any longer. The demon Lord, apologizing for the delay, hurried on his way, trying to calm the tense atmosphere. Realizing that he must outwit his pursuers before becoming a victim, the hero plans a counterattack. The task seemed overwhelming. Ten well-armed men against him alone. How could he overcome such an advantage? Looking around him, he finds the answer in his surroundings. They were in the castle of the Day of the Talion, a place fraught with many dangers. He believed that at least one monster must be hiding in the labyrinths of this place, which he could use for his own purposes. The leader of the hunters tried to speed up the movement, mockingly encouraging the Lord to move faster. One of them even threatened to kill the Lord as soon as they got the treasure, which only added fire to his determination. Passing by the remains of the monsters, the Lord realized that they were not fresh and would not be able to help him. Because the searchers needed a living enemy, he realized that he could not rely on outside help. Only his own strength and intelligence could help him. If this world is a real game, then he, being a demon lord, has unique abilities that he can use. Having discovered this chance, the Lord is preparing to use his abilities to survive this dangerous game, looking for a way to his freedom. By activating the eyes of Zeus, Lord gains a unique ability to see the invisible, turning the game into a reality where his every move matters. He realizes that this game is his new reality, and he is ready to use all the means at his disposal to win. The Zeus system panel opens in front of him, where he sees a detailed map of the game world, including critical areas and categories to pay attention to. This gave him a significant advantage over other participants, igniting his lust for life and excitement for the game. Using this gaming skill can dramatically change the course of events. Eyes of Zeus is a special skill from the dungeon defense game that allows you to open the map and other important elements of the game. This skill allows you to see the last location of enemies, your own items in the inventory, and lay traps providing a great advantage in the game. 
It is usually used in the middle of the game, but in his current position, Lord can use it from the very beginning. This was the perfect opportunity for him to get more familiar with the game mechanics and its features, especially in Dentalian Castle. Although he wondered why he was here, he still didn't understand what good this place could do. But despite all his doubts, he did not give up and continued to look for ways to use his newfound advantage. Realizing that this is only the initial level of the game, the roads here are not covered with corpses of enemies which is unusual for a dungeon. A sudden bright light flashed before the Lord's eyes, making him wonder what it could be. The system informs him that the number of military forces in the Demon Lord's castle is currently zero, which is extremely dangerous, and the player needs to recruit more soldiers to defend it. The guy holds his breath at this message, surprised and worried by this information. The system prompts him to choose which monsters he would like to hire, providing 100 game Librons for this purpose, allowing him to choose from the available options. This was one of the special skills of the Demon Lords, the ability to hire monsters for their own army. However, there was a limit to the use of this skill. He could only spend 100 Librons. The Lord ponders why this Lord has so little money and what he has done so far that has led to this situation. These reflections prompted him to think about his strategy and how best to use his limited resources to strengthen his position in the game. After thinking about his situation, he realizes that even with the ability to hire 10 goblins, they will have a hard time standing up to 10 heavily armed hunters. He decides that the best option is to hire golems that can create a surprise attack on the hunters, giving him the advantage in the battle and passing this test with flying colors. Having carefully thought out his tactics and calculated his every step, our hero prepares for action. He continues to analyze the map and combine all the facts to make a final decision. He's convinced that his plan can work. He estimates his chances of success at 60%, which is much higher than the risk of dying. Looking around him, he realizes that there is no time for much deliberation. With no other options on the horizon, he decides to take the risk and seize this opportunity. Morally rallying and clenching his fists, he sets himself up for a serious confrontation, preparing for the battle with full commitment and concentration on the goal. He realizes that the success of his plan will open up the possibility of gaining the trust of the hunters, which is the first step toward his goal. Therefore, it is important to work with this information to the best of his ability. He casts the spell Apostle of Aphrodite, standing unnoticed behind the hunters. This allows him to see over their heads, titles, races, levels, skills, and other characteristics. Aphrodite's Apostle is a skill that allows him to see statuses, making his opponent's strengths and weaknesses visible. With this information, he can pinpoint the weaknesses of his opponents and take advantage of them. The realization that he can now predict the end of the hunters fills him with joy at the discovery of such possibilities. One of the hunters notices that the Lord is moving too slowly, which makes him unhappy. He shouts at the Lord, accusing him of being unworthy, and demands that he speed up, pointing his sword in his direction. The Lord tries to apologize, assuring him that he is doing his best to go faster. The hunter starts laughing mockingly, baring his teeth, which only adds to the tension of the moment. He points his sword at the Lord, urging his comrades to pay attention, preparing to attack. But our hero doesn't waste any time. He's ready for a counterattack that will begin immediately. Planning his actions a few steps ahead, he sets the stage for the deployment of his strategy. Everything is ready to hire monsters, which will be the first step in the execution of his masterful tactics. His first task is to gain the trust of the hunters, which will be the key to the successful execution of the plan. His facial expression and burning eyes indicate his relentless determination and the beginning of a counterattack. Apostle Aphrodite is one of the high-ranking skills available in the game Dungeon Attack, which allows you to see in detail the statuses and weaknesses of other players. Thanks to this skill, our hero has the opportunity to learn everything about his opponents, knowing their weaknesses and skills. Now, with all the necessary information about the opponents, our hero knows their vulnerabilities and is ready to use this knowledge in his strategy to outwit them and gain an advantage. One of the hunters warns the Lord not to provoke his anger and to move faster. Our hero seemed to agree with every word of the hunter, enduring his abuse without objection. But at the same time he studied all the statuses of the hunter, and realized that one of his characteristics made him the leader of this group. Despite the great risk, in a difficult situation, he held on to his left arm, which was injured. But he believed that with the power of the Lord, he could defeat them regardless of the circumstances. They passed through the dungeon arches that served as a symbol of the entrance to the Lord's domain. The group moved forward confidently, leading the Lord as a hostage, illuminated only by the flickering light of the torch. The Lord looked around him, noticing the skeletons of the warriors who had failed to reach the end of their journey. He realizes that the time to act is now, 
preparing for decisive action at this point. Everyone listen to me! The Lord shouts loudly, urging everyone to stop immediately. The hunters, surprised by the sudden exclamation, suddenly stop and pay attention to him. They begin to ask what is happening and why they need to stop. To gain their trust, the Lord apologizes for the interruption and explains that there is a trap ahead. Pointing his finger in the direction of the danger, he demonstrates the location of the trap. However, the hunters were skeptical of his warning because they could not see the trap from a distance. The Lord offered to come to the front to better demonstrate the situation. He warned them that if any of them tried to go further, they might be hit by an arrow directly in the head, and it would be impossible to go back. Deciding to demonstrate by example, the Lord walks forward, ready to show how the trap works. By deliberately limping, he seeks to prove his point and point out the real danger that awaits them ahead. One of the hunters decisively shouts, STOP! Stopping the Lord in his tracks. His companion notices that from that moment on, the road becomes much darker, and it becomes harder to see the people from their position. At this critical moment, the demonic Lord disappears from their sight, as if vanishing into thin air. The hunters shout after him, trying to stop him, but he fearlessly marches on. One of the hunters shouts, warning the Lord that his escape will fail, trying to convince him to stop. However, the Lord continues on his way, answering that the hunter shouldn't worry about his escape, because he can't even run because of the pain in his leg. He emphasizes that this is his chance to earn their respect. He notes that these hunters are different from other adventurers because they did not try to kill him right away. The Lord says that if they don't trust him, they can follow him, but he can't guarantee their safety on the way. The hunters were worried by his words, thinking that he was trying to scare them and manipulate the situation. This made their boss very angry, who could not understand how the Lord could scare them because they were on the verge of killing him. One of the partners urges the boss to stop and think before taking the next step, emphasizing the importance of caution. They realize that even one mistake can lead to the trap stopping them forever. Suddenly, huge stone blocks on chains fall from the sky. The first of the traps. One of the hunters narrowly avoids being hit by jumping away at the last moment. Damn it! swears one of the hunters, asking if they really don't realize that this is all a trick of the Lord. The boss of the hunters indignantly claims that the Lord is trying to escape from them. At this time, the Lord quietly moves away from the hunters into the depths of darkness, planning his next move. After entering the cold dungeon and making sure that no one is following him, he's relieved to know that he has gotten far enough away. Behind him are two arrows he collected on the way, which may come in handy in the future. The Lord had a cunning plan to use the arrows to cause some chaos. Sensing the uncertainty of what lies ahead, he decided to take them with him. At this moment, when reality and challenge merge, he holds the arrows tightly in his hands. Gritting his teeth, he convinces himself that this is just a small obstacle in his path. Lifting the arrows up with both hands, he prepares to plunge them into his body, preparing for the extreme step. A minute passes and the hunters are unable to move. Watching the Lord's actions in bewilderment, suddenly they heard a voice. Perhaps it was the voice of the demonic Lord Denthalion himself, shouting something. One of the hunters exclaims, trying to understand what is really happening. An uncertain voice comes from the darkness of the cave, asking why they haven't moved forward yet. The henchman turns to his boss to ask what to do next, but the boss is pensive unsure of his own decision. With a final word he says, Finally get ready guys. If we relax now we will die right here, preparing his team for a possible confrontation. The realization that this is not the time or place to give up makes the treasure hunters pull themselves together. Despite the trembling in their legs they begin to move forward cautiously. The search for the demonic Lord Denthalion is accompanied by loud shouts asking where he is. As they continue on, the group notices a pool of blood on the path. The hunters realize that this pool of blood was left there for a reason, and that there is a trail leading to it. They light up the path with their torches, and continue to follow the trail until they find Denthalion lying in the blood. Worried, they ask him what happened, noticing something sticking out of his leg. Denthalion groans in pain, unable to give a coherent answer. Going forward without caution turned out to be an unjustified risk on his part. One of the hunters tries to find out what really happened, and whether the Lord was really trapped, beginning to suspect that they might be deceived. They did not question the Lord in detail about whether he could really have fallen into the trap so easily, ignoring his condition. The hunters behind the boss exchange glances, suggesting that anything is possible. One of the hunters turns to the Lord in a rage, accusing him of not helping them and failing in his own traps. Our hero, holding his hand over his heart, replies, as he said before, that they, the hunters, are different from other ordinary treasure hunters. They didn't try to kill him right away and saved his life at this critical moment. The Lord promised to do his best to help them move forward. He then noted that he had missed one of the arrows precisely to save them. To demonstrate this, he pulled the arrow out of his leg, saying it was not a big deal. 
holding the arrow in his hands, he shows everyone that, despite all the adversity, they need to keep moving forward. The hunters were not entirely sure of his intentions, doubting whether he was serious. But the confidence that the Lord radiated in his words impressed the hunters, making them think about his proposal. The system reports that Traveler's confidence in Denthalion has increased by five points. Denthalion notices that the hunter's trust in him is growing, which makes him happy. This unexpected turn of events amazes the Lord because everything is going exactly according to his plan. The hunters nearby in the dungeon have changed their attitude towards him, increasing their level of respect to 15 points. The Lord is pleased with the change in the hunters' attitudes, seeing their trust in him grow before his eyes. But this is not enough for him. He realizes that more needs to be done to successfully implement his strategy. He urges hunters to not waste time and keep moving forward. His strategy has not only increased Anthalion's credibility among the hunters, but also improved his position in the game. He sees his plan begin to work, opening up his first opportunity for survival. He rises from his knees, leaning on his healthy leg, and calls out to move forward. One of the hunters replies that although he does not understand all of the Lord's intentions, he sees his willingness to sacrifice himself to achieve a common goal. Noticing how slowly the Lord's feet move, the hunters realize that they have no choice but to follow his lead. The boss asks his men to help the Lord get to the treasure. One of the hunters takes the Lord on his shoulder, saying, Let's go. The Lord thanks him, looking him straight in the eye, and realizes that everything is going according to his plan. The Lord's actions, which demonstrate his protection of the hunters, have won them admiration and approval. However, despite the positive emotions, the group needs to keep moving forward, remaining alert. The Lord is confident that everything is going perfectly according to his plan. The boss of the hunters, although a difficult opponent, has finally shown his vulnerability. However, this is not enough for a complete victory, and Lord knows that he needs to move on. To fully control the situation, the Lord needs to take even more steps to manipulate the hunters, and he prepares for the next act of his plan. Finally, they reach the entrance to the temple, the goal of their journey. It was the entrance to the Demon Lord's temple, the place the hunters had originally intended to find. The entrance to the temple was really impressive, and the hunters were stunned by its majesty, which far exceeded their imaginations. Deciding without hesitation to open the door, they easily realized their intention. One of the hunters is pleased to say that they have finally achieved their goal. They ask the Lord to show them exactly where his treasures are hidden. Suddenly a teardrop falls to the floor, attracting the attention of everyone present. The Lord cannot hold back his tears, which flow down his cheeks, causing surprise among the hunters. The hunters are confused not understanding the reasons for the Lord's emotional reaction. They ask the Lord what happened to him and why he suddenly cried. The Lord replies that it's nothing to worry about. He's just remembering his former comrades and the family he once had. The hunter replies with a smile, hinting at surprise. Demon Lord, did you have a family? The Lord confirms that he did have a family. It was a long time ago in the distant past. Those times when he had someone who loved him seem unforgettable to him. He stretches his hand forward as if trying to touch his memories. He sees a ruin in front of him, a place that was once his home and family. In his memories, he sees this place in all its pristine beauty, with goblins and orcs standing guard and mages providing protection. But then came the dark hour. A huge army decided to attack and burn everything he held so dear. The Lord entered the fray, trying to protect what was his. The army sought to kill the Lord, pointing their swords and arrows against him. They loaded their crossbows and bows, deciding to shoot at him. The enemy arrows hit the Lord directly in the back causing him to be anxious and desperate, because he could not respond to the attack. When he had almost resigned himself to the thought of imminent death, a huge orc suddenly appeared behind him. The orc addressed Lord Denthalion, which deeply touched the hero. The orc asked if he was okay, and at that moment arrows hit the orc, thus protecting the lord. The lord recalls this event filled with tears because that day he almost lost his life. His faithful servant saved him from death by taking the blow on himself. Then the orc told him to run away, to leave him and escape as quickly as possible. The Lord could not hold back his tears, asking why the orc was sacrificing himself, promising that he would never forget his heroism. The orc's blood splashed around. The scene was filled with the heroism of the orc defending his lord. Taking more and more blows, the orc reassured the lord, saying that he should not worry about him. The orc urges the lord to run away faster, because he knows that he cannot hold on much longer. Death was already too close. This heroic act saved the lord's life and he cried, overwhelmed with emotion from the memories of the past. Lord's tears expressed his deep despair at the experiences that had come over him. He honored the orc's memory by sharing this sad story. The Lord spoke about the heroism of the orc who saved his life and the tragic circumstances that allowed him to survive. 
The orc not only died, but also protected the Lord, who, being in this place, restores past events in his memory, sharing his story with the hunters. The hunters were touched by the Lord's story, sympathizing with him for the fact that his life was prolonged by the sacrifice of his ward. One of the hunters expresses his opinion that the demonic Lord, in his opinion, should have been a worse person than he actually turned out to be. The Lord replies that he is crying for his dead comrade, demonstrating his humanity and deep feelings. One of the hunters notices that Denthalion doesn't really look like someone who personifies evil, emphasizing that his actions and emotions point to a completely different personality. Denthalion notices that his story is beginning to build trust among the hunters, and he senses a change in their attitudes toward him. The system reports that the level of trust among the hunters who heard his touching story increases to 20 points. The boss of the hunters wonders what is going on and how this story relates to their goal, questioning the relevance of the Lord's story. He recalls his mentor's words about the need to be careful with the Lord, who may use deception, and that neither his tears nor his words can be trusted. The Lord observes how his actions have affected the hunters, increasing their trust by 15, 20 points which favors his plans. One of the hunters' leaders decides that it doesn't matter what the Lord says, only whether he is useful to their goal. Denthalion addresses everyone who is listening, saying that they were the ones who were able to touch his heart and bring him back to the time of his reign. He emphasizes that they are not like those who killed his family, and he promises that he is ready to die for them at this very moment, demonstrating his loyalty and willingness to sacrifice. The discovery that everything in the temple, including the treasures and the Lord's very life, was now in their hands, made a great impression on the hunters. The hunters' joy was evident, but they could not help but ask, Where are the treasures? The Lord said that, as he had said earlier, the treasures were protected by magic. He promised to remove the curse from the treasures and asked the hunters to move away from him, emphasizing the seriousness of the moment. The hunters' greed knew no bounds. They were eager to get the treasure and did not notice the trick in the Lord's words, fulfilling his demand. After retreating to a safe distance, they asked if this was enough for the Lord to begin to lift the curse. For the Lord it was more than enough because they swallowed his ruse and he was happy that everything was going according to plan. Denthalion asks them to move a little further away, hinting that his plan is almost successful. Laughing, the Lord activates his magic, ready for the final step of his survival. After analyzing the situation and his position in the game, he realizes that the real treasures were never in the castle. In fact, they were hidden in the game character Denthalion before he was reincarnated. They were 100 Lebrons. The Lord realizes that even this small amount of Lebrons is enough to make his plan successful. In the dungeon attack game, one Lebron is equivalent to 15 silver coins. The system asks if he wants to spend 76 Lebrons, causing the Lord to think twice. Looking at the game settings, he realizes that there are many ways to use items and funds. Deciding to spend some of the Lebrons on hunters, the Lord hopes that this will help him realize his plan. Having trapped 10 men and hired monsters for the Lebrons, the Lord is satisfied with the result. He raises his hand as if to cast a spell. This is a seventh-ranked spell that belongs to the demon Lord Denthalion, according to the rules of this world. The Lord announces that he is empowering the brave heroes in the name of Denthalion and giving them all his treasures. At this point, everyone held their breath waiting for what would happen. But to their surprise, nothing significant happened. The boss of the hunters was already in the mindset that they had been tricked. But suddenly everyone froze when they saw the next thing. The Lord's spell worked completely unexpectedly for everyone present. The coins began to fall to the floor with a sound, bouncing off the stones. Hundreds of coins created a real rain, bringing joy to the hunters who caught each of them. They watched this miracle with delight, as if they had won the lottery. In their minds, this moment seemed to be the realization of dreams of untold riches. The boss of the hunters, pleased with what he saw, opened his mouth with happiness, not hiding his delight. A rain of coins filled the entire room, painting a picture of unlimited wealth in the hunters' minds. The hunters collected the coins enjoying every moment of this moment, full of joy and happiness at their find. The boss, holding the coin in his hand, realizes that they have achieved their goal and can finally feel their weight in his palms. He is overwhelmed with joy, which is only growing with each passing minute. His face glows with happiness and greed, as if it could burst with emotion. The system informs the Lord that the hunter's recognition and love for him has increased by as much as 50 points. Their boss is ecstatic that they have finally found the treasure but urges them not to hesitate, but to collect it quickly and move on. He is convinced that he can use the demon lord even more, believing that killing the lord now would be a waste. But the lord decides to address everyone with an important message. He asks everyone to focus their attention on him, waiting for his request to be fulfilled. One of the hunters replies that now is not the time to talk, 
as everyone is busy collecting coins and asks the Lord to wait. Meanwhile, the hunters greedily collect every coin. Their attention and loyalty to the Lord is growing steadily. Denthalion awkwardly apologizes for distracting them, but emphasizes that he has important information to report immediately. The Lord reports that about 30 new travelers and hunters have now entered the dungeon. The boss reacts to this news with delight, as he feels excited about the upcoming confrontation with the newcomers. At the same time, his wards are embarrassed by this information, realizing the potential danger to themselves. The Lord explains that he used magic to detect the approach of strangers, but did not expect so many of them. Hearing this, the hunters are at a loss, not knowing how to deal with so many people. The hunters wondered where such a large group had come from and how to confront them, because thirty people are a serious threat. In an attempt to avoid a fight, the hunters ask the Lord if there is an alternative way out of the castle to bypass the main entrance. But the Lord, overcome with despair, says that there is no other way out than the way they came. The hunters think about what to do if they are attacked in the place where they are now. They realize that thirty people can not only destroy them as treasure hunters, but also tear this place apart in less than a minute. An atmosphere of uncertainty envelops the group, and even the boss is at a loss, not knowing how to proceed. But the Lord has a secret plan, which he decides to share with the hunters, prompting them to take further steps. He explains that if they can't avoid a clash, they should attack themselves. The boss of the hunters is skeptical of this answer, pondering its meaning. The Lord points out that he has a map that can help him organize a defense or an attack. However, he admits that his forces are not sufficient to determine exactly which side the attack will come from. But regardless of their location, they can act independently, using available resources and circumstances. This information has sparked further questions among the hunters, as they try to understand what exactly it means for their current situation. The Demon Lord continues, Do you know how many people might be here? They may have been part of a military division. They may have used magic and so on. They will feel my magical energy and come straight to us. The map shows several tunnels leading to the exit. You can take different paths and find different exits to the surface, and I, as a defender, will be engaged in strategy and delay the enemy. Lord offers. Hearing this, the boss of the hunters realizes that the Lord is ready to sacrifice himself again, which seems uncharacteristic of a demon lord. In a state of shock, the boss asks the Lord if he is not planning to escape with them now, and if he is not bluffing about the criminals who may not even exist. Lord, feeling that he might be discovered, answers in confusion, Of course not. I would never do such a thing. I just want to help you, that's all. In any case, you have had time to see that what I say is true and to believe me partially, the Lord says. So the decision is yours, hunters, he adds. At this point, Denthalion passes one of the hunters. The hunter in despair does not know what to do because the risk is enormous. The hunter realizes that Denthalion was not really lying about his intentions and proposals, and decides to support his strategy, preparing to act on his own according to his plan. The leader of the hunters asks the Lord not to share the details of the plan with everyone, as this might cause anxiety among his men. He orders his men to stop collecting treasure and prepare to leave the dungeon. The demon lord is closely watching the events unfold, pleased that everything is going according to his plan. He is confident that nothing can go wrong, as the hunters trust him and urges them not to doubt their choice. The whole team, together with Denthalion, leaves the temple, passing through the majestic arches of the dungeon. The demon lord on the shoulders of one of the hunters shows the way, illuminated by torches. One of the hunters notices that perhaps the lord is already able to move on his own. He is displeased with this, because he believes that the lord should save his strength. The situation returns to the moment when the hunter ordered his subordinates to collect all the collectible coins and prepare to leave. The plan was to split into several groups and head for the main exit in different ways. One of the employees doubted this plan, considering it pointless and inefficient, but the boss insisted, demanding that he be quiet and listen, emphasizing the importance of familiarizing himself with the map of the area. He explained that by using the map they could determine their location and find the paths leading to the exit and choose one of three possible routes. Given that 30 soldiers are like a small army, the boss emphasized that directly confronting them at their level would be unwise, and that their survival depends on avoiding combat. Thus they got a chance to survive in this situation. The soldiers felt tense after these words, realizing that one of the groups might not survive. But the boss tried to reassure them, saying that two of the three groups would definitely survive, and if they were lucky, perhaps all would. He also said that he would take responsibility for protecting the treasure. His team did not like this decision, as they feared that he might take all the treasure for himself. The Lord reassures his team that he has no intention of taking the treasure for himself. They unite with the Demon Lord in one group, preparing to take action. This group, under the guidance of the Demon Lord, 
receives a blessing and a disguise that should help them avoid meeting danger. If the group survives, they will leave the treasure at the central exit and will no doubt become heroes. If they fail, the consequences could be much more serious. One of the hunters takes responsibility for the treasure and goes forward. He asks if everyone is ready to go. With a greedy smile, he calls for a show of strength. Among themselves, the hunters discuss that he probably wants to die heroically. One of the hunters decides to ask the Lord about his family waiting for him and the potential danger to the entire group. The boss addresses his team, emphasizing whether they are listening to him or not, noting that this is a tense situation that is causing concern and possible rebellion among the hunters. The captain emphasizes again that if any of them want to survive, it is necessary for everyone in the room to survive. These words encourage the team spirit of the brigade. As a result, they split into groups and went their separate ways. One of the leaders of the hunters realizes that he has fooled all these idiots, convinced that his strategy is correct. He believes that concentrating in one place cannot be effective, and that splitting into groups will give them a better chance of survival. During the conversation with the Demon Lord, they discuss that Denthalion should not escape, and that they do not have enough time to discuss all the details. The Lord assures them that he has had enough time to decide whether he should escape, and emphasizes his seriousness. He declares that he can defend himself, and all the treasure, if he manages to survive, will remain with him. Thus, if he decides to act in his own interest, some people may be sacrificed, but his share of the treasure will increase. In any case, this will be a win for the leader of the hunters regardless of the outcome of events. The hunter, having heard the words of the demon lord, fully agrees with them. The leader of the hunters, moving toward the exit, reassures himself with the thought that reaching the top is of great importance to him, and he is indifferent to the fate of his subordinates. At this point, the lord realizes that the commander of the hunters is far from being the smartest with his plans. Studying the map, the Lord prepares to realize his plan. He is going to accomplish what all of this was planned for. When the hunters break into smaller groups, the Lord sees an opportunity to carry out his plan to defeat them. Using the money he has left, he hires mercenaries to kill all the hunters. At this point, the dungeon begins to shake violently. The shaking resembles an earthquake, which threatens to bury the dungeon and everyone in it under a pile of rocks. One of the hunters asks about the cause of the shaking, whether it is an attack by invaders. Everyone is shocked by the situation, holding on to each other, looking toward their group and trying to understand why the ground is shaking so violently. Suddenly, the group witnesses magical effects appearing around them. The wind blows fragments of stones back and forth, and the fires that had been lit for illumination suddenly go out. The torches fall to the ground, and the dungeon becomes completely dark. No one can see anything. The hunter who is carrying the Lord asks him what is happening and what should happen next. But the Lord puts his hands over his mouth, demanding silence. He whispers that it is better not to make a sound if he wants to survive more than his friends. The Lord emphasizes the seriousness of the situation, hinting at the danger that awaits them. Pulling out a sword from his inventory, the Lord tells the hunter that he is grateful to him and will remain in his debt. The Lord's words bring tears to the eyes of the hunter, who realizes the gravity and threat of the moment. At this critical moment, the demonic Lord decides to take the hunter's life with his sword, making a decisive and unexpected move. The rest of the hunters, focused on the strange pictogram that has formed on the ground in front of them, do not pay attention to the tragedy that has taken place behind them. They stare at the magical symbol as if mesmerized, trying to understand its meaning and purpose, as they have never seen anything like it before. The pink icon radiates a powerful energy that causes fragments of stones to fall, and an unknown creature begins to emerge from it. When the hunters realize that a strange creature is emerging from the icon, they are shocked by what they see. A stone goblin appears in front of them, radiating deadly energy and threatening them. The goblin not only appears in front of the hunters, but also begins to attack them, demonstrating its aggressiveness. The hunters are terrified, trying to understand what kind of creature has emerged in front of them, sharing their fears with each other. The large goblin begins to destroy the dungeon by throwing large boulders, causing panic among the audience. In fear of the inevitable, the hunters scream, but their cries go unheard. The stone monster causes a collapse in the dungeon with its blows, killing the hunters one by one, leaving only smoke and ruins in which nothing could be seen. One of the treasure hunters, trying to avoid the dust, is horrified to see his comrade crushed to death by a large stone clay through the dissipating smoke. This picture of death causes him fear and despair. The stone goblin, not paying attention to his loss, continues his destructive path, raising a huge stone arm against the other hunters who scream in pain. One of the hunters, full of determination, rushes into battle with his sword, trying to stop the goblin. However, the goblin easily breaks his sword into two pieces with a single swipe of its stone hand. 
the hunter realizes that his only means of defense, his sword, is now destroyed, and he feels terrified of the imminent threat. He sees the next blow of the stone monster inexorably approaching him. Realizing that the situation is hopeless, he realizes that there is nothing he can do. The instantaneous blow of the stone goblin meets the hunter, crushing him so much that there is not even a trace of his existence. The other hunter, faced with this horrific scene, stands motionless, paralyzed with fear, and unable to take a single step. The hunter saw the pool of blood left by his partner, and realized the tragedy of the moment. He realizes that there is no point in running away because there is no chance of returning, so he is paralyzed with fear and frozen in place. Lord Denthalion approaches him from behind, but the hunter cannot understand who those hands belong to. He asks the Lord what is happening, and if there is a chance to quickly escape from all this horror. But the Lord, without saying a word, sneaks up behind him, and suddenly pierces him with his cold sword, carrying out his deadly sentence. This unexpected blow came as a real shock to the hunter, because he trusted the Lord. The unsuccessful treasure hunter falls to the ground lifeless, having completed his journey. A satisfied smile appears on the Lord's face, and he turns to the others and ironically asks why everyone is so sad. Pointing to himself, he challenges the audience, as if asking if no one really understands who he is and what his true role is in all these events. The demon lord proudly proclaims that his true nature is demonic, and he does not hide it. Meanwhile, the second group of hunters, continuing their journey through the dungeon, have no idea what fate awaits them ahead. They hear a distant echo echoing through the tunnels, and the boss of the hunters wonders if the battle has already begun, and if the demon lord was telling the truth after all. One of the warriors, a bald man, remarks that perhaps the demon lord has indeed done something useful for them. Suddenly, Lord Denthalion appears in front of them, stopping the travelers in their tracks. The group asks him why he is here and why he is standing in front of them. The lord, feeling confident, stands in front of the hunters, demonstrating his power. The boss of the hunters is happy to see him and asks if the lord has kept his promise not to run away, but wonders where the rest of their team is. At this point, the lord pulls out his bloody knife and says with cold certainty that his friends have already followed him, hinting at their deaths. Lord Denthalion holds a dagger in his hands and tells the boss of the hunters that his time has come and he will be the next to join his fellows. The lord, holding the dagger, comes closer and touches his finger to try to take a drop of blood from the hunter, saying that he will take it into consideration and think about their offer. However, before making a decision, he ironically notes that he might kill them all first. After these words, the travelers panic and ask him to repeat himself, hoping that they just heard him. In the devastation of the ruined temple, the hunters cannot understand the Lord. They perceive his words as the last warning. The Lord emphasizes that they should look back to see their own faces at the moment of death. The boss of the hunters, furious, calls the Lord a traitor, his face so tense that it looks like it will explode with anger. He declares that the battle begins right now. The system informs the Lord that his popularity has dropped to zero and everyone has a deep hatred for him. Lord Laughing says that he is glad to see them in such a confused state, comparing them to mindless monkeys and can't wait to expose their stupidity. He ironically asks if they really believe that the Demon Lord would take their side, emphasizing the absurdity of their hopes. In response to his words, the treasure hunters felt more deceived than ever. The enemy's words made them feel like mere spoons caught in a clever trick. Furious to the point of anger, they could not find words to express the depth of their hatred. A multitude of curses and insults poured out of their mouths, hurled at the sinister provocateur. But their main task, which stood against all odds, was to kill the Lord. This goal united them, adding to their determination. Armed with swords, sticks, and maces, they rushed to attack, dreaming of how their blows would find their target. But in the darkness, behind the demon Lord's back, lurked a creature far more terrifying, a huge goblin eagerly awaiting their encounter. His eyes, full of cold calculation, bore into the hunters. For him, they were nothing more than prey doomed to defeat. And when they approached, with a huge swing of his powerful arm, the goblin turned them into nothing. Only dust and shadows remained of the brave men. The blow was so strong that it raised a cloud of dust, and among the stones and rubble, one could see a single bloody hand sticking out from the rubble. The other traveler was simply nailed to the wall by the force of the impact, turning him into a miserable stain. The victor, the stone goblin, slowly turned his gaze to those still standing, ready to continue his destructive reign. The realization that they were unable to stand in this battle filled them with horror. The possibility of victory seemed like a mirage, but the realization came too late. The stone monster easily smashed their ranks, leaving only one of the leaders, who watched the defeat of his team, stunned. The leader sadly realized that the battle was not in his favor. However, amidst the pile of broken dreams and dashed hopes, a ray of hope appeared. 
a bald warrior with a huge sledgehammer, who, without losing his determination, rushed at the goblin. Gathering all his strength, he struck the stone monster with a mighty blow. The blow was so strong that the goblin was shattered into pieces and scattered around. The victory filled the warrior with joy. He returned to his leader, proudly declaring his feat. But in that triumphant moment, the leader saw his life slipping away from him. The demon lord, not missing the opportunity to seize the moment, pierced him with his sword as a punishment for his excessive courage. Denthalion, with cold satisfaction in his voice, proclaimed that there was only one left, and he wanted to thank him for daring to act so recklessly. Denthalion's words only inflamed the treasure hunter's anger, causing him to respond fiercely, but at that moment he noticed something incredible. The stone goblin that had been nearly smashed to pieces began to regenerate right before their eyes, reassembling itself from the stones and standing side by side with Denthalion. This realization left the leader with no choice, for the war was no longer on his side. The Lord explained that it was possible to kill the goblin by smashing its stone shield, but this required specific knowledge and experience. Otherwise, even preparing for a clash with such a powerful defender, victory would not be as easy as it might seem at first glance. Denthalion hinted that if the hunters hadn't split up and acted together, they would have had a good chance of winning. Now that the tide had turned and he felt victorious, Denthalion excitedly asked the leader how he planned to proceed. Terrified, the leader realized that he was in a hopeless situation that had radically changed him and his views. He was facing not just an enemy. This was a real demon lord, a creature that embodied the true threat. His power and strength were terrifying, emphasizing that the lord was not just an opponent. He personified a danger of incomparable proportions. The leader of the hunters, being in a critical situation, realized that quick decisions would not bring success. He thought deeply about his strategy which ultimately gave him hope for survival. This moment was recognized by the other hunters as a decisive maneuver that could save them all. Realizing that direct combat is hopeless, he decides to throw his sword to the ground in a surprising move. Kneeling down, he humbly addresses the Lord, Kill me. Dantalion, holding the bloody sword in his hands, replies with cold indifference, Very well, I understand you. He approaches with slow steps the kneeling hunter, who with his head bowed, is waiting for the final blow. But the hunter was not as easy an opponent as he seemed. He considered the Lord naive and used this moment to get closer to him. This desperate ploy was the hunter's last hope to win this unequal battle. And now the moment of truth has arrived. The decisive moment when it becomes clear who will emerge victorious. The hunter, who had a hidden ace up his sleeve, a small dagger kept behind his back, was ready to use it against the Lord. However, as he approached the hunter, Lord Denthalion was focused not so much on him as on a message from the system that could change the course of events. The message the Lord received opened up the possibility of hiring new monsters to strengthen his army. His balance was updated, and now he had 100 Librons on his account, which significantly increased his potential for further maneuvers. At this critical moment, when the Lord was approaching the hunter, the latter expected the enemy to take a few more steps in his direction. The hunter believed he had the advantage of a knife hidden in his sleeve and was ready to strike decisively. He measured every second and every step of the Lord's approach, preparing for a decisive attack. The anticipation of his upcoming victory made his heart beat faster, but the Lord suddenly stopped, not taking a single step closer, and holding his sword in his hands, stood motionless. The hunter, tense to the limit, watched his opponent with distrust, trying to understand the reason for his stop. What an ass you are, the Lord suddenly said, addressing the hunter, who was still on his knees. I can see your thoughts, he continued, and I know about your hidden knife. Did you think you could deceive me? With these words, the Lord showed his superiority, demonstrating that he knew about the hunter's plans before they were realized. The Lord, unable to contain his mockery, laughed, pointing his sword directly at the hunter and exclaimed, Yes, it is time to finish you off, coward. These words, like a spark, caused an explosion of anger in the hunter. He could not stand being called a coward, and the thought of surrendering seemed unacceptable to him. The hunter's eyes were filled with rage. He could not allow himself to be disrespected. This can't be the end, not here and not like this he thought. In response to the insult, the hunter pulled out his hidden dagger with a charge of unbridled energy and rushed at the Lord with all his fury. He rushed forward, releasing a battle cry from his chest like a wind carrying destruction. But at the very moment when the hunter was preparing to strike the decisive blow, he found himself on the ground, not having achieved his goal because the Lord suddenly disappeared. And while the hunter was still trying to understand what had happened, he realized that the Lord was now standing behind him. Turning around, the hunter saw not the Lord, but some indefinable creature, slippery and elusive. It was not Denthalion, but a slug, a master of illusion and deception who managed to deceive the hunter so skillfully. The hunter, 
amazed that he was facing not a lord but a slug, could not understand how this happened. What the hell? He thought as he felt the slimy creature on his leg. The situation suddenly changed, and the hunter found himself on the ground as Denthalion approached him, taking advantage of the moment of surprise. The hunter, gathering his last strength, raised his hand trying to strike the lord, but his hand, which was already ready to attack, was instantly grabbed by the stone goblin. A powerful squeeze turned the attempted attack into a futile one. Pain gripped the hunter as the goblin mercilessly flattened his hand, showing the superiority of his strength. Denthalion, looking at the system window, smiled, realizing that everything was going according to his plan. He was surprised at how effective the slug was in stopping his enemy. The lord, satisfied with the result, sarcastically asked the hunter how he felt, especially now that everything was not going according to plan, and whether he considered himself helpless and desperate. Mockingly, Denthalion drew his sword, continuing to demonstrate his superiority, and asked the hunter how he felt when everything around him was falling apart. Despite the state in which the hunter was, the lord struck him, leaving him no chance of survival. The hunter, wrapped in fear and despair, realized that he could only accept his fate. He thought about where he had gone wrong, and what he could have done differently. But it was too late. The hunter was burdened by thoughts of the past, wondering if it was the right decision to leave the lord alive. He couldn't understand why they didn't finish the job. If they had acted differently, everything could have turned out differently. It all started when they received the treasure map from that woman, but, in fact, the beginning was laid even earlier, when they believed the Demon Lord's lies. Now the hunter realizes that he will not be able to resist the real Demon Lord, cold and ruthless, a great strategist. Suddenly everything around him is filled with white smoke. In this fog, the hero sees his father, who says that the task has not yet been completed. The boy asks what his father wants, but is told that no matter what he chooses, his life will be unsuccessful without his father. The fog and the voice in his head do not give him peace, and he tries to dispel them. But what the hell? He thinks, suddenly beginning to hear a voice calling him. Opening his eyes, he sees a beautiful girl standing in front of him, telling him that he is finally awake. He finds himself in a luxurious room, lying on a comfortable bed, and asks what is going on. The girl replies, hinting that he hasn't been able to regain consciousness for a long time. After these words, she carefully bandages his chest, providing him with help and care. Recalling how he had spent several Librons on donations two months ago, plus 96 Librons on a date, she carefully bandaged his chest, putting all her attention and care into every movement. He recalls spending a bunch of Librons on donations for the dungeon attack game, as well as trying to organize a date, hoping for a positive outcome. In total, he spent 196 Librons, and she hopes he can continue their communication today. He ponders, not understanding what she wants and what this whole incomprehensible situation is all about. His adventure began three weeks ago, when he became a Dentalian, Waking up in the body of a 71 saint-ranked lord in the game dungeon attack, he found himself in a completely new reality. A group of treasure hunters tried to kill him, considering him their enemy. As the dungeon manager, he was forced to defend himself by confining and destroying all the attackers. Now, however, he recalls falling to the ground, exhausted after a hard battle. He feels tired as he leans on the stone goblin that was part of his ordeal. In the end, he realizes that this is finally the end of his incredible adventure. And he has survived, finding himself in this unusual room, with memories of hard trials and victories. Paying attention to the system's tutorial, the hero receives a message that his level has increased. Seeing the sword sticking out of the enemy, he realizes that the victory over the villains has made him stronger. The system announces that the tutorial has been updated, giving the hero the opportunity to learn skills of the first level. Various symbols and signs began to appear before him. Now all these skills he has collected can be used directly in battle. The hero realizes that in the future, there will be no time for slow progress, given that he is only at the first level of his development. But after waiting for a while, he realizes that his adventure is just beginning. He thinks that if he continues to increase his levels as a Dentalian, he may be able to return to his world at the end of the game. The hero realizes that standing still is not an option. He needs to move forward. But to do this, he needs to choose the right skill, which will be the key to success. In this situation, he is faced with a choice between several skills, where one is much better than the other. So he will have to think carefully before making his choice. Choosing between the available skills, our hero pays attention to a special S-class skill called Apostle and Aphrodite. This skill not only promises a significant increase in status, 
but also broadens the point of view, providing new perspectives. In addition, this skill opens up opportunities for better understanding and analysis of other skills, making it extremely useful for the hero in his further adventures. Realizing the importance of this choice, the hero is ready to continue the game, armed with new knowledge and skills. Looking around at the devastation left by the battle, he feels tired. The battle exhausted him not only physically, but also mentally. His desperate efforts and struggle for survival left him at the end of his rope. The returned enemies lay around him, testifying to the ferocity of the battles he had experienced. The hero realizes that he needs time to recover, perhaps a whole day or night. Deciding to rest, he approaches the stone goblin which remained unshaken and asks if he can use it as a bed. As he falls asleep in the stone goblin's arms, the hero feels protected, which allows him to feel peace for the first time in a long time. The next time the hero comes to, he finds himself in a bed inside an abandoned house, where everything around him has been chaotically scattered. The place where he found himself resembled Denthalion's room, where he seemed to have been brought by a golem on his hands. Hoping that everything he had experienced was just a dream, he soon realized that he is still Denthalion, and he is a prisoner of this reality, unable to free himself from the image of the Demon Lord. His memory has been wiped clean, and now he has to get used to the role of the Demon Lord again. Looking thoughtfully out the window, the hero realizes that his worries do not matter in the face of a new catastrophe that was coming. At this critical moment, a girl approaches him and starts a conversation. He turns to her with a question about what happened. The girl who appeared in front of him had a cold, piercing gaze like permafrost. Her name was Lepis Lezuli. According to Dantalion, the maintenance of this girl required a considerable amount of time and money. Dantalion replies that he did not take any money on credit and that it was not him. Lepis apologizes for her rudeness admitting that she has difficulty understanding his words because of their different points of view. She explains that she joined his team two months ago, and it was the Chamber of Commerce that gave him the money on credit. As proof, Lepis brings a document stating that Dentalion promises to return the money, according to the terms of the contract. Lord realizes that this argument has no power of persuasion for her and that they have been trying to solve this problem all week, as if in jest. Previously, his problems were created by bandits, and now credit collectors come to him. Denthalion sarcastically reflects that this world really sucks. He wonders why it is he who has to correct mistakes and restore order after the actions of the previous lord. Lepis, having heard his monologue, intervenes, calling everyone idiots for granting a loan to such a dubious person. The girl's words seriously anger Dentillion, who is impressed by her courage and directness. He decides to ask her a few questions. Lepis agrees to answer his questions without any problems. Denthalion's first question was, If the money is not returned, what will happen to the Lord? Lepis explains that in the event of Dentillion's bankruptcy, the first step would be to officially declare himself bankrupt. This explanation did not seem to be a complete answer to Dentillion, so he asked for clarification on what exactly would happen after the bankruptcy was declared. She replied that in that case, the Chamber of Commerce would take ownership of the Demon Lord's castle and be able to sell it. In addition, they will have the right to address him with less significant requests. Lepis asks if he considered these circumstances when he took out the loan. Denthalion has only one question left, which seems incomprehensible to the girl, because she cannot grasp its essence immediately, being confused by the aura of power radiating from the Demon Lord. She admits that she did not understand him and asks him to clarify the question. Denthalion, not hiding his impatience, sharply asks for the date, the day, month, and year. Lepis apologizes for the misunderstanding and answers that it is April 17, 1505. The Lord begins to laugh, noting that there are only six days left until the next loan payment, and if the situation does not change, he will have to declare bankruptcy. This laughter frightens Lepis, who cannot understand why he is behaving this way, but Denthalion has a proposal for her. He wants to take a loan of 10,000 Librons from a trade organization, which is an astronomically large figure. The scene shifts to a place where large eagles are circling the castle of the Kenchushka Company, which is the headquarters of the Chamber of Commerce. A little goblin runs through the corridors with incredible agility, knocking down everyone in his path like a small storm. He runs as fast as he can, frantically writing something in his notebook. It seems that he has a very important task from the headquarters of the Kenchushka Company, where the goblin Torkel plays the role of a tireless messenger. The goblin's task is to urgently deliver an important letter to the port of Batavia. His speed and dedication to the mission demonstrate the great importance of this document. At Kinchuska's headquarters, everyone was working together, but time was running out, and Torkel knew he had to make sure everything was ready to go on time. Meanwhile, word of an emergency meeting was spreading among the senior management team 
but the reason for the meeting remained unclear to most. One of the tardy executives apologizes for his tardiness by running to the meeting. At the meeting, he is met by mysterious figures, including an old man resembling Count Dracula, who points out Torkel's tardiness. The old man addresses the audience with intensity, emphasizing that time is money for traitors. He urges everyone to start the meeting as soon as possible without wasting a minute, marking the beginning of the tenth chapter of this story. The Kanchushka firm is the headquarters for the fifth-ranked lords, including the demon lords Melbus and Payman, as well as their bodyguards, who together form the most powerful demon company in the world. Among those present, the person who leads the organization stands out, Ivan Lobrock, a representative of the Vampire Academy in the demon world. The reason for today's urgent meeting is to be explained by a girl named Lapis who serves the audience. A girl we know, recognized by Ivan Lobrock himself, takes the stage. Among the guests of honor are lizard demons and mice who are watching her with admiration. They are not happy with her because she is not a hybrid, but a mix of succubus and human, which makes them displeased. They wonder why she's participating in this exclusive meeting, as she does not belong to their bloodline, expressing their displeasure with her. However, Lord Ivan Lobrock cannot stand their dismissive attitude, not even letting them finish, and angrily tells them to shut up, his eyes blazing with anger. The goblin, watching his master's reaction, almost faints from fear. After his command, everyone is silent, and Lord Ivan asks the girl to continue. She states that the 71st-ranked demon lord, Denthalion, has requested a loan. One of the goblins, interrupting the girl, angrily exclaims that everyone has been gathered here because of such a rogue. He scoffs claiming that the girl is wasting their time and is just playing a joke on them, asking what is seriously worth talking about. But Lord Ivan Lobrock calmly intervenes, addressing the goblin named Turkle, demanding that he calm down. He states that they will now discuss Denthalion's request. The girl continues, revealing that the Lord is asking for a loan of 10,000 Librons. This amount shocks the audience, particularly the orcs who cannot believe their ears. Turkle, shocked, demands confirmation. Did she really say 10,000 Librons? He points out that this amount could serve as the national budget for a small country. He can't believe that Denthalion would say he wanted such a huge amount of money. The girl confirms that yes, the Lord did make such a request. She elaborates that she knelt before him, repeatedly asking him if he realized how big a request he had made, emphasizing the seriousness of the situation. Denthalion addresses the girl with emphatic seriousness. You heard me right. I said I want to borrow 10,000 Librons. She replies that this is an extremely large sum and that his credit rating allows him to borrow only 196 Librons. Despite this, Denthalion sits confidently on his throne and insists, Why not try it? I want more. The girl tries to object. You're exaggerating. I don't even know what to say. Let's not discuss this. Lend me the money. Why not? The Lord insists. Are you saying that the demon Lord Denthalion is incompetent in this world? He asks calmly, sitting on his throne in front of her. She replies that she is not. She cannot even think about it. Dantalion remarks, You can't even think about it, but I'm ready to get that money back from this place. Do you want me to go bankrupt and my firm to go under? He asks rhetorically. Moving closer to the girl, he stands up, getting her full attention. Dantalion insists on getting an honest answer from her. He asks her a question. Do you think I am wrong in my judgment? She answers trembling, No, not in this case. Then he asks her to ask him a question and give him another answer. If you came here on behalf of your company, why don't you lend me this money? It will help me solve many of my problems, won't it? He says. But she replies that she does not have personal access to such resources. The Lord insists that the whole situation is just a game of masks. And the words of a woman in such a situation are interesting. But it is important to return to the main question. Why should your company lend me money? In fact, the motives don't matter. If I've spent my whole life being a servant of this company, he reflects. You have to lend me 10,000 Librons and find a way to pay it back. It's a great deal, isn't it? He concludes, convincing her of the deal. She expresses her doubts, asking how the deal can be beneficial for him if he ends up being a company lapdog for the rest of his life. Don't you think you should stop and think about it? She continues her musings. He gently takes her chin as he answers. I've thought about it, don't worry. Looking her directly in the eyes, he asks if she is ready to follow him, despite his plans. She moves his hand away from her chin meeting his gaze with a challenge, and calls him a scoundrel, adding that she understands him perfectly. Standing in front of the assembly, she asks about the request for 10,000 Librons, but one of the goblins points out that he cannot even pay 100 Librons, so Denthalion's request is definitely voted down. Lord Ivan notes that her position is clear, but asks for more details. She agrees with the Lord and continues her story. If you don't have any other questions, perhaps you should tell us about something that fascinates you.
she says to the audience, trying to change the direction of the conversation. Denthalion seemed to have lost touch with reality, but he confidently states that he can do something better for himself. He plans to make these changes for the sake of someone he loves deeply. The goblin appears confused by the hints about the loved one, not understanding what he is talking about. Dentelian explains his statement by claiming that he, as Lord Dentelian, suffers from brain stress. The Senate is concerned about this unclear answer and tries to make sense of his words. Speculation arises about a scary woman, suggesting that this could be the demon lord in female form. She declares that she has promised to become his companion, doing her best to do so. The Senate, irritated by such boldness on her part, demands that she be expelled without accepting her offer. Everyone holds their breath as Dentalion makes a suggestion that why not do the company a great favor by hiring him as their lapdog. Dentalion starts laughing out loud, convinced that his plan will work and he will become the company's lapdog for life, which he thinks is a great idea. Dentalion asks the audience what they think of his proposal, noting that it could be a successful experiment in creating a human hybrid. The goblin suggests that such a step would not only integrate Dentalion into the structure of a large trading company in the demon world but would also radically change his fate and reputation as a destroyer, even offering him a return to honor. In this scenario, she will become the wife of a demon lord. However, the couch lord can't help but laugh, claiming that this is an art of deception, because the Kanchushka company likes to hire puppets and has no intention of lending money to the incompetent Lord Dentillion. However, it is a special loan intended for him and Lapis' servant. Denthalion will return to the demonic castle, where he will receive the promised 10,000 Librons. But this deal will change his fate forever, because he will not be able to get out of this situation, having lost any possibility of choice, unless he returns the debt on time. Our story opens in 1505, in a city that thrives on its merchants and sailors. The story takes place near a bustling commercial port, where huge ships cut through the waves, docking in the city, promising adventure and new discoveries. The appeal to Mrs. Leaps sounds like a call to surprise. She is reproached for her last decision, but she, unshaken, confesses her desire to collect every plant of this continent, putting into her words the dream of a collection of infinite beauty. The merchant, confused and partially surprised by her answer, cannot hide his concern. Why does such a sophisticated lady want to collect ordinary grass, for which she is willing to spend the astronomical sum of 80,000 pounds, hiring people for such an unusual mission? However, with unwavering confidence, she reassures him, advising him not to worry about the reasons and to follow Denthalion's instructions. She emphasizes the urgency of the task, stressing the need to implement it as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the girl, confidently walking along the city streets in her elegant shoes, attracts more and more attention from the locals, her figure becoming an object of general interest. She walks by as if not noticing the indifferent stares, but men can't take their eyes off her, discussing her in earnest. Behind her back, they laugh and discuss her actions. They mock the fact that she spends huge sums of money on the orders of the great demon lord. They say that if Denthalion spends so much money, he must have gone mad. And this is the end of his greatness. Some people jokingly suggest that the girl might be his mistress. But few people believe in the seriousness of these words. The next day, on the 20th, the plot moves to the castle, shrouded in mysterious darkness, which creates an atmosphere of mystery and uncertainty. The girl, undeterred, goes to Denthalion, wanting to share with him the details of her extraordinary mission, which promises to open up new facets of their story. At the moment the girl appears in front of him, he is immersed in reading a book, but her presence immediately distracts him from the pages full of ancient secrets. He asks her if she has fulfilled his order, to which she replies in the affirmative, without concealing her pleasure, specifying that the herbs he ordered were successfully purchased, and that the place he chose for them is well protected. Noting her diligence, he closes the book, emphasizing the completion of this stage of their conversation, and continues the dialogue, appreciating her efforts. He asks her questions about her next steps, adding intrigue to the conversation. Denthalion's face glows in the dark with an unclean sheen as he declares his desire to borrow another 10,000 liras, revealing his ambition. The girl is surprised by his frivolous attitude to finances, wondering about possible reasons for this behavior among which she suggests the expectation of an epidemic, which could explain such a large loan. Responding to her musings, he comes to the table to pour a drink, inviting her to guess his intentions, adding mystery to their exchange. She, confessing her ignorance, expresses the sincerity of her feelings and tries to understand his plans. Raising his glass, he does not get up from his seat and expresses his approval of her actions, 
as if summarizing their conversation and her contribution to the common cause. He expresses his desire to congratulate her on her successful completion of the task, offering to drink to it as if it were a toast, emphasizing the importance of her contribution and her place in their common cause. But Lala refuses to accept his offer of a drink, which is not well received by the Lord, who feels insulted by this refusal. With a slight irritation, he demands an explanation as to why she decided to reject his offer. Noting that he wanted to do something special for her, Lala is a little embarrassed and apologizes to him, trying to smooth out the tension. However, the Lord diffuses the situation by admitting that it was only a joke and asks her not to make such a sad expression as he hands her a glass. He gently praises her for her diligence and the work she has done, urging her to drink to their future together. Finally, Lala takes a sip from the glass, accepting his offer. She drinks it down, performing a kind of ritual of consent for their future together. After the drink is finished, she gently wipes her lips and turns to the Lord with a question, wondering what kind of drink it was. The Lord, feeling amused by the situation, does not hold back his laughter, which is loud and infectious, dispelling any tension between them. He reveals that the drink was made from the same herbs Lala was tasked with collecting, and asks her how it tastes, and whether she finds it pleasant. Lala is incredulous at his words, asking in surprise if he is joking. Confused by the surprise of the discovery, he assures her, with seriousness in his voice, that he is not prone to joking in such matters, emphasizing that he spent as much as 10,000 Lebrons on this drink. Standing up from his throne, he notes with a smile that she has probably already informed the company about his seemingly ridiculous expenses and his desire to create a cure for the plague. But is it worth it? The demon lord ponders licking his fingers after tasting this mysterious nectar, turning the situation into a joke. At this point, Lala just looks at him, unable to find the words to respond, amazed by his action and words. However, the Lord is interested in something else, and he thinks about the date, asking her about it. Lala replies that according to the imperial calendar, today is June 20th, but at the same time wonders why he needs to know. Surprised by his sudden interest in the date, pondering in his throne, he addresses her, calling her Lala again but with a different intention. He hints that she will not be able to come to the castle for some time, which indicates a change in their plans or relationship. Continuing, he expresses his desire to go to the city whose name he has written down on the paper, indicating a new goal or mission that awaits them. Lala wonders what the trip to the unknown place mentioned by the Lord might mean, but it remains a mystery to her. The Lord only replies that she will find out later without giving any details, leaving room for intrigue. Lala realizes that the Lord is overwhelmed with business in his chamber, and suggests that by sending her to the bathhouse, he may be trying to find time for rest and relaxation. Time flies and soon the imperial calendar points to the 24th, opening a new chapter in their adventures. Our heroine arrives at the royal baths in Sardinia, intended for travelers from Syracuse. There she undresses in preparation for the rite of purification. Tying up her hair before the shower, she reflects on the Lord's motives asking herself why he sent her here, to such a special place. In the bathhouse, she meets other girls who have also come to enjoy the steam treatments along with her. The bathhouse becomes a meeting place for women from all over the kingdom, but Lala still doesn't understand why she was told to come here. Stepping into the water up to her waist, she continues to ponder the Lord's cryptic message, which still haunts her. Reflecting on the kingdom of Sardinia and Syracuse, where this public bath is located, she wonders if unusual symptoms, such as joint aches, fever, and bruising, could be harbingers of the plague. As she sinks deeper into the water, she concludes that none of this is possible, and that her lord does not have the power to predict or influence such things, calming her doubts and contemplating her next steps. Unease grips Lala when a sudden sound catches her attention, triggering her alarm and readiness to act. She immediately leaves the water and rushes over to the girl, who is lying lifeless on the floor with the other bathhouse patrons gathered around her. The green-haired girl, wrapped in a towel, lies motionless on the hot stones, and it is clear from her condition that she is suffering greatly. Lala tries to find out what has happened to her, asking her how she feels and asking her to pay attention to her words, trying to help. But the girl could only say one word, pain, which led Lala to focus on identifying its source, trying to understand what kind of pain she was talking about. She describes the pain as something that burns her from the inside, to which Lala responds immediately, promising to send her to the hospital without delay. However, Lala's attention is drawn to a horrifying sight, spots that begin to spread across the green-haired girl's body, leaving her in shock and disbelief. The stains expand to envelop the girl's body, who begs for help, which only increases her sense of helplessness and terror. 
This moment makes Lala remember the note that has been haunting her. Is the plague prophecy beginning to come true? She cannot believe that her worst fears are beginning to materialize. The sight of the black bruises on the girl's body, which exactly match the description in the note, fills Lala with horror and makes her think about what to do next, realizing that there is less and less time to think. Enveloped in the thick steam from the hot springs, Lala decisively approaches the fainted girl, deciding to examine her body more closely to understand the cause of her condition. She calls for help, exclaiming that immediate assistance is needed here, while asking herself about the mysterious calamity that has engulfed the place. After she takes the girl to the clinic, the moment of truth comes. The doctor, examining the patient, is horrified to discover that this is the 30th case today, and advises everyone who is still able to do so to hurry home and try to get some rest. Sitting on the bench, Lala thinks deeply about the nature of these mysterious black spots that have caused so many cases. She can't get over the questions that storm her mind. How could such an incredible and senseless disaster happen? The doctor, amazed that she is the only survivor of the bathhouse, asks about her condition, as all the other bathhouse visitors have died, which only increases the anxiety in the atmosphere. The scene in the morgue opens with a picture of many bodies lying one after another, reminding us of the scale of the tragedy. The doctor, deeply concerned about the spread of an unknown disease, orders her to leave the place immediately and take precautions. In the face of this incomprehensible mystery, Lala finds herself on the verge of despair and incomprehension as she watches the consequences of the terrible disaster that has struck the city and tries to understand how she can influence the situation or at least protect herself from the unknown evil. Immersed in her thoughts, Lala gradually realizes that this event has a deeper meaning. She recalls the moment when the Lord offered her a drink, about which he initially did not want to give details. Later, he reveals that the drink was made from herbs that he asked her to gather, laying out pieces of a puzzle in front of her. At first, she refuses to believe this is possible, but finds no other explanation for why she survived. Inside, she resists this thought, not wanting to accept it. At the same time, although it is unpleasant, she cannot deny the truth. She comes to the conclusion that the demon lord may have created the cure, planning to save them from an imminent threat. Time flies, and the imperial calendar marks July 16th. The fairy, holding a scroll, glides effortlessly down the corridor. As if driven by an invisible wind, Mr. Turkle is sitting in his office, interrupted with a slight apology during tea. He responds to the interruption ironically, joking about his encounter with Paw Paw, a fictional person, and apologizes to the person who disturbs him. Across from him sits a gorgeous woman who calmly inquires about his business, hinting at the possible importance of what is happening and showing her willingness to listen to him if he's facing any urgent problems. With the grace and self-confidence characteristic of a woman of great beauty, she reassures him, reminding him that there is no reason to worry. It turns out that this man is none other than the ninth-ranked demon lord, known for his beauty and charm, Paimon. All of Turkle's apologies seemed out of place in the presence of such a personality who aroused his intense curiosity. Tired of the importance of her message, the fairy announces that she has an urgent message from headquarters. Turkle unfolds the scroll, determined that if the message turns out to be something trivial, he is ready to take decisive action. After reading the first lines, his face suddenly changes, reflecting deep anxiety. The letter contains information about an epidemic originating in Syracuse that is rapidly spreading throughout Sardinia, threatening to spread to neighboring countries in the future. The death rate from this disease reaches 80%. Byman, observing Turkle's reaction, asks what happened, sensing a change in the atmosphere. Turkle grinds his teeth in frustration and disappointment, realizing the gravity of the situation they have to address. An additional message that goes along with the letter contains information that Lord Denthalion is developing a miracle cure for the disease. Lapis Luzi, one of his subordinates, has monopolized access to this medicine by order of the Lord. Because of this, the headquarters needs to meet immediately, as the current value of the medicine is estimated at 3 million gold coins. Shocked, Turkle listens as Payman asks him to show her what it says, showing a growing interest in the unfolding story. She decisively refuses holding the document in her hands and notes with alarm, no, not that. As she reads the information, she realizes the depth of Lord Dentalian's plans and his potential to profit from the epidemic by holding a monopoly on treatment. Seeing Turkle's reaction, Payman cannot contain her pleasure at the revelation of this secret, although Turkle remains unaware of the reason for her joy. With her characteristic ease, she waves her pen and responds with interest, finding the situation very intriguing. At this time, Lord Talion is standing at his window, gazing thoughtfully into the distance, anticipating future events. 
He is watching the situation with full attention, realizing that a storm is gathering on the horizon. The Lord finds pleasure in this, reflecting on his plans and the future. A girl unexpectedly approaches him, and he greets her by saying that she has returned sooner than he expected, and enthusiastically asks if she has been able to relax and rest. The girl feels that he is mocking her, because he knew full well that there would be no rest, knowing the importance and seriousness of the moment they were experiencing. Despite her obvious stress, he continues to probe noting her pale appearance and asking in surprise why she did not enjoy the hot springs as he expected. She, with sincere seriousness in her eyes, points out to him that he was well aware of the real reason for sending her there, and that there is a true reason for all of this. He, with an ironic smile, asks her questions as if he does not understand what she is talking about, prompting her to explain herself in more detail. She does not hesitate to tell him directly that he should have been aware of the outbreak of the epidemic in Syracuse and how it affects their situation. She also mentions the herbs he had ordered to be gathered, which could be used to create an amazing cure for this disease. Outside the castle windows it is raining and he continues to pretend that he has no idea what she's talking about, playing his part to the hilt. But then as he gets closer to her, he suddenly starts laughing, enjoying the moment, seemingly finding something entertaining in the situation. He admits that he could have said this from the very beginning, but he didn't, hinting that everything is just beginning and they will see a lot more. The girl feels a demonic energy emanating from him, which further emphasizes the mystery of his personality and intentions, forcing her to wonder about the true meaning of his words and actions. He reflects with satisfaction on how he foresaw the development of events from the very beginning, confident in the necessity of what was to come. In the game Dungeon Attack, the story unfolds in 1515, a decade after the plague swept the world, plunging it into darkness. According to the game's plot, the attack on the dungeon takes place in a summer town with hot springs called Syracuse. It was only a year after the epidemic began that a cure was discovered. Black grass, which until 1505 was considered a common weed. He started the game in the year of the epidemic, using the knowledge he had about black grass. He recalls the moment when he saw the company's loan document, which impressed him greatly. And all this time he was thinking about a girl, his beloved Lala. He slyly asks her what she thinks of the company. She replied that the company was going through a lot of turmoil, like a disturbing nest of wasps, and that an emergency executive meeting had been called. As he approaches her, he says he knows, because he saw everything with his own eyes. But he wants to know why this happened. Why aren't you at the firm right now, and why did you come here? The Lord expresses surprise, looking at her with a question in his eyes. Let me guess what you're thinking. Do you think that returning to the firm now will pose a threat to its existence? He continues trying to guess her thoughts. Lord is sure that the firm's employees are unlikely to be able to understand the real reason for her actions, considering it almost impossible. The most interesting thing is that the disease may have been deliberately spread, but who did it and for what reason? The company had only one answer. It might have been you, Mrs. Lala. His words strike her like a bolt of lightning. She realizes that she's become a tool in his hands, an object of manipulation used to further his interests. He has purchased thousands of special plants in the very place where this whole story began, which only emphasizes his involvement. The whole situation is built around the idea that she is supposed to be his muse, his inspiration. You know all about that, says the Lord, emphasizing that this is why she is here and will not be able to leave the firm. This thought seriously scares the girl, forcing her to think about everything that is happening. She realizes that from the moment she was born, she was considered a hybrid, a mongrel, easy to manipulate by someone who wanted to use her for his own purposes. She has worked hard and worked tirelessly in the firm to get to where she is now, with a vengeance in mind for all those who have ever harmed her. What she had worked so hard for seemed so simple now, but in reality, it was much more complicated and marred by deception. She looks at the man in front of her, wondering about his true identity. She is sure that she knows him, but she cannot believe that the reality is so far from what she expected when she returned to him. The real demon lord is standing before her, the person she really knew inside. Oh my dear, you are faced with a choice, the Lord tells her, emphasizing the inevitability of her decision. The only way he offers is to submit to him, to become his servant, to accept his will without objection. If she agrees, the Lord promises to give her real power and responsibility for all operations related to the treatment of the disease, giving her the opportunity to change the situation. This proposal throws her into a deep shock as she did not expect this development. The Lord continues by saying that the plague will devastate this world, taking the lives of many, making no distinction between children and those in power. Death does not choose. Even those who once despised it for its origins as a hybrid, 
We'll be desperate to find ways to survive in this new reality full of threat and challenge. In this new world full of chaos and despair, she will find many who will seek to deal with her. The half-demon human, once condemned for her nature, will now become a key figure in the fate of hundreds of thousands. The Lord asked her a question. Isn't this the power you wanted? What are you going to do with it? Without hesitation, she realizes that she must accept his offer. But a strange excitement grows in her heart, making her wonder why she feels her heart beating so strongly. In the room, by the window where she is, she kneels before him without hesitation, accepting his will. A smile appears on her face, reflecting her inner acceptance and understanding. She says she understands why things have turned out the way they have. Now her life belongs to His Majesty Lord Denthalion, and she accepts this fate with all seriousness and devotion. Kneeling down she takes his hand and kisses it, recognizing him as her lord and master, ready to serve him and do his will, which now becomes her destiny. The Lord addresses her with affection. Oh my dear Lala, will you not give me all your strength? I will also do this for you and grant you majesty. The fancy dinner was prepared by Lala as a symbol of her devotion and new role. She sits at the table, waiting for her lord to arrive, full of determination and a desperate desire to serve. Realizing her new position, she accepts the role of Lady Dog, the Demon Lord's handmaiden. Now her life, as well as her will, belongs entirely to the Demon Lord Denthalion. A week after this event, she brings him lunch, continuing to fulfill her duties with renewed devotion. There's a knock at the door, but no one answers for a long time, adding to the tension of the moment. A lot of time has passed, but the door remains unlocked. Determined not to wait any longer, Lala decides to open the door herself, ready for any scenario. She finds the demon lord sleeping peacefully in his chair, looking calm and serene, in contrast to the usual tension of their encounters. This painting makes her wonder about the depth of the bond that unites them, and the unknown aspects of his personality. Around the lord chaos reigned, alcohol, scattered shirts, books. All of this testified to the disorder that filled the room. He threw his legs out on the table and all the while seemed to be reading books, pretending to be an ordinary inhabitant of the castle, not its owner. Sometimes he even slept with a book over his face so that the light would not disturb his peace. But suddenly the book slid off his face and onto the floor, breaking the silence. Watching the scene, the girl can't understand why the Lord is behaving so frivolously and chaotically. She wonders why Lord Denthalion has changed and is no longer the same person he used to be. Six months ago, she approached the Lord with her own personal goals, introducing herself on behalf of the Kentish Company, hoping to find support from him. He harshly told her to shut her filthy mouth. At that point, he added that he didn't care about the name Dirty Mongrel, and that he was too busy to pay attention to what she wanted from him. He turned out to be much worse than she expected. But when she showed him the money, he signed the deal without hesitation, demonstrating his true priorities. Then she started spreading rumors that there were treasures worth stealing in the Demon Lord's castle, encouraging travelers to try to rob it. One of the travelers asked her for a map to these treasures, but she refused him, not wanting to make the task easier. She wanted to make the Lord feel desperate and despairing, hoping that he would come to her, begging for help. However, the Demon Lord exceeded her expectations, demonstrating unusual restraint and wisdom in handling the situation. Now she is in charge of the lives of almost half the continent, and possibly more, given the importance of the medicine. Despite this, Lord is able to sleep so peacefully as if he feels confident in his actions and decisions. She has already received letters from various countries regarding the procurement of the drug, which indicates that she has considerable influence. As expected, her firm remains silent about its actions, which is surprising and distrustful to others. The goblin approaches the gate of the great Lord Ivan, asking if he is here, looking for an opportunity for a dialogue or meeting. Ivan invites Turkle in, saying, Turkle, come in. It turns out to be the headquarters of the Kentushka firm, Ivan's room. Turkle enters, but does not find the owner in the spacious room, which only adds to the mystery of the story. Turkle notices that the candles in the room are out, and the space is enveloped in emptiness. Ivan's voice comes from the darkness, asking Turkle to sit down. In the dim light from the lit lamps, Ivan appears on his throne, ready to talk. Clasping his hands together, he asks about the situation, trying to get a complete picture of what is happening. Turkle replies that it is difficult to convey all the grief in words. The plague is spreading rapidly through the kingdom, and it is only a matter of time before it engulfs the entire world. According to their analysis, approximately 30% of the population will die from the disease. Turkle's reaction to the 30% figure was angry, as it seemed absurd and almost joking to him. Ivan looks at him sternly and asks him when he ever joked about such serious topics. The atmosphere in the room becomes so tense that the wind almost extinguishes the candles. Ivan declares that starting today, 
all the lords will suspend all trade with the firm. Turkle barely has time to catch his words, feeling the gravity of the situation. Turkle slams the table to express his irritation. Damn, it's all because of that damn mongrel. His words are filled with anger and frustration at the situation. Ivan asks curiously, What happened to her anyway? I still can't get in touch with her. I think it's just as I expected. I guess it's safe to say that she was planning to betray the company in advance. Turkle reflects. According to the report we received, Lalapis was in the area where the plague started and has been buying up and monopolizing the herb that can be used as medicine for several weeks now, he adds. Turkle ironically comments on her prophecy about the plague, considering it ridiculous and unbelievable. Even God cannot predict the plague. It is clear that the plague was not an accident. It was clearly planned, he reflects. Lord John came to this conclusion while in his room, pondering the situation. He asks Turkle if he really believes that someone deliberately gave them this trouble. And who could have been the inspiration behind it all? To which Ivan suggests that it could have been a young girl named Lyapis. But she's so small and gentle that she couldn't have done all this, he adds, expressing doubt about her direct involvement in such large-scale events, despite all the accusations. Turkle accepts this view with sadness and suggests that Dentalian may be behind the disaster. However, they doubt Denthalion's ability to pull off something like this, as they believe that he would never do such a thing, given his high position, if he could not guarantee his safety. They assume that someone is behind their predicament, making them mere pawns in a larger game. The question remains, who in the world would deliberately create and spread a deadly infectious disease? Ivan says that he knows of only one person capable of doing so, causing intrigue. And who could it be? Turkle asks, filled with concern. Ivan reveals that it could be the continent's most brilliant necromancer, the immortal monk, known for his black magic of sickness. He is an eighth-ranked demon lord whose name is Bartos. If this is true, and Bartos is behind this, then he is indeed capable of such an act. Bartos has always had contempt for humans, causing many wars and destroying many countries. If this plague spreads, harming humans, it could do more damage to humanity than to demons. And if the situation gets out of hand, people may even be driven to the brink of extinction by the scale of the potential catastrophe. Turkle reflects on the true nature of the demon lords, wondering if their actions can really be so destructive and ruthless. If Bartos is behind all this, what are you planning to do, Lord Ivan? Turkle asks, looking for answers. The firm has long maintained good relations with numerous demon lords, and it is because of this support that they have achieved considerable success and greatness. No matter what, if you're planning to fight a demon lord, we need to prepare and gather all possible evidence to confront them, Turkle says, emphasizing the importance of the evidence base. The word evidence alarms Ivan, because they have good reason to believe that Lalapis and Dentalian must reveal the whole truth to them. But Ivan is not worried, because he has already taken certain measures and is ready to act, confident in his strategy. I'll do whatever I want to them, and I'll pity those who try to oppose me, he says, demonstrating his power and determination. The goblin is impressed by his words when a gorgeous girl with green hair enters the room. She brings him a scroll, to which Ivan responds, You're here already? The scroll contains certain information. But Ivan, activating his demonic power, sets it on fire, choosing to destroy the contents rather than have this information known to others. He laughs out loud as he sees the spell burning in his hands. He asks the Turkish woman to go to the majestic Mr. Payman and tell him everything we know. The only one who can stand up to Bartos is His Highness Payman, he realizes. Of course, Payman and Bartos have a negative attitude. His Highness makes no effort to cooperate. Ivan wonders if this is accidentally haunting him. He disappears to his throne, leaving much to be done. As the ghost disappears with the red smoke, Ivan, stumbling over a stone, cannot wait. Behind the girl's back, he sinks his fangs into her neck, begins to drink her blood, and says, She will be first. She will be first. And he will make her the centerpiece of his collection he says, sucking the girl's blood fervently. Then Lapis tries to awaken his master Dantalian, but he does not wake. But he opens his eyes and asks what has happened. She replies that they have just received a summons. The Lord reacts to the word summons with a sleepy look as if asking the question, what is it? To which the girl gently replies that there was a meeting and no one had ever received such a summons out of the blue. This is how it began. The demonic Lord who owns the laws of this world, they all gather and everything that happens in the castle on Walpurgis night is organized by His Majesty Ivan. The witch flies on her broom and hums a song about herself. She wonders who her next client will be. Maybe it will be His Majesty the Demon Lord. Oh my god, by the way, she says. His Highness? How could he fall in love with a half-bitch, half-man, couldn't he? Oh, this forbidden love, how romantic. 
The witch is sure that he is a wonderful gentleman, she said, but for now, boys, please don't interfere in his life. Now she is almost there, looking at the lord's castle. Lala shouts to the demon lord, Please, come along! They go through the dungeon, but he doesn't want to follow her at all. He doesn't need to. She keeps screaming and he says, Please shut up. And why are they leaving the dungeon at all? What happened? He closes his eyes from the light. The girl says that it is the so-called Walpurgis Knight. And how could he not know that if he is a demon lord? She asks. She thinks he has never had the opportunity to participate in this before. He shrugs and says no. How funny the girl's response is. I can see that you don't know what Walpurgis Knight is at all. It is a significant event where demons and their followers gather. Together they solve problems, transcending national borders to maintain world order. There is no clear schedule for their events. Our hero plugs his ears and says that this gave me even more reasons not to go there. But she wasn't joking, and one way or another, this is a topic that is relevant now. The main purpose of this meeting was to honor His Highness, you understand? And the main city where this meeting was held was Nelthelm. And this is no coincidence, because the headquarters of the Kentucky-based firm is located in that very place. And now you have a monopoly on the miracle cure for the plague if he doesn't come. So, they will definitely find a reason to destroy them all. Thinking about these words, Lore didn't want to go there. But the devil was giving him one problem after another. But it was true. It would be very bad if force was used against them. With his hand in his pocket, he said, Then let's go to Walpurgis Night. If there is room for discussion, we can certainly come to the same decision. And in the worst case, he has a backup plan. He has his favorite doll, Lucy. That's one of the reasons why he spent so much money on it. He says to her, follow me, Lala, and he walks on. Which road do we take to Nifelheim? It would be better for the firm if I didn't attend. So they're probably planning to do something while we're looking for the truth. And they have to be in that place at any moment. They hear someone humming the melody of a song, saying the words in a musical voice. I've come to take you away. The witch laughs as she sits on her broomstick and continues to sing. She says she is at your disposal. The Lord looks at her with a shocked look, realizing that he has never had to work with witches before. The witch finally stopped, and her bare feet became visible. She got down on the ground, sat down and began to dance a little. After thanking everyone for choosing her from the servants, she told them that she was here to accompany His Majesty, the Great Demon Lord, on his travels. She and her sister Barbara knelt before the Lord and introduced themselves. Lord Talion was not expecting such an appearance. He quietly tells his ward that they are all children, but she replies that everything will be fine so that he realizes that he shouldn't judge a book by its cover alone. And once they accept the deal with the demon lord, they will stop growing forever. The fact that they look so young is proof that they are very talented. She opened her mouth in surprise to learn that they were at least 200 years older than her. He coughed into his hand and said, I see that would be very rude of me. Barbara's sisters, please raise your heads. I would like to thank you very much for accepting this offer. We will be under your care. They, Barbara's sisters, were amazed by his words. And the girls were touched because he was just so sweet. People just watched, not feeling any emotion to it. She got a little angry when he said those words to those witches. They raised their magic fingers in the air and said, the time has come to deliver you. They showed him his magic witch's throne and said, please sit on it. He asks if everything is going to be okay, but not to worry. Your attention, please. Thank you for choosing our services. The hairdressing sisters set to work with gusto. The weather is so nice today. The breeze is blowing, they say and set off on a wonderful journey. Please enjoy the journey. By the evening, they reach the city. Here is a large statue in the city center, the city of Nelheim, Hermes Square. A beautiful moonlit night and a lot of people in the city center. The witch says it must have been hard to sit for six hours. She hoped he was holding up well after such a long flight. Anyway, it wasn't easy for you to get us here either, the Lord said. He offered to thank them by inviting them to dinner. They were delighted with this offer because it was a great honor for them. And in this case, they know the places ahead, and the witch says, Please lead us the right way. The authorities wanted to confront His Highness with his proposal. The Lord said, Aren't we tired from this long journey? I will literally die if I don't drink at least a little. Everything was clear about this Lord, the girl realized. He was just an alcoholic. He asks the girl if the firm is going to do anything about it, and she shouldn't worry too much, because no one in this place would be stupid enough to attack a demon lord. Asking if she understood his words. They went to a tavern where the demons were drinking alcohol, getting drunk. The people at the neighboring tables were having fun with the orcish girls. The Lord noticed that it was quite lively, wasn't it? The city was independent of class, race, or other differences. Everyone could count on a good time here. Like a witch, she points her finger and says, We are here too. 
Before he could get to the witch's words, the Lord noticed the strange sound of people screaming. Several people are kicking and accusing an elderly man, and he apologizes profusely. The old man is accused of saying that the alcohol tastes bad, the chairs are like harps, and the service is just terrible. You are trying to make money when you enjoy it. They kept kicking him, accusing him of being a bad old man and that he should just go away. I draw your attention to that, my lord. He turns to his servant, Lolly, as well. He says, So what's with all this trash? She replies that it is the 72nd rank demon lord Andromalius. In this world, a demon lord of the 72nd rank can do such arbitrariness. Our hero has always wondered what he is, the 72nd demon lord. Now, when he sees himself putting his glass on the table, laughing, he starts drinking wine. When he gets to the city center, he raises his glass up. His servant tells him not to do that, but he knows he can do without it. He lifts the glass up and deliberately throws it to the ground. The wine spills onto the floor. The drops cut through the space, attracting the attention of the locals. The Lord says that the journey will be more interesting than he expected. The moment the dungeon attack game begins, 72 demonic lords who ruled this world are fantasy games whose goal is to defeat them. When the protagonist was a boy, his village was destroyed by a demon lord. Years later, the protagonist grows up and becomes a hero whose goal is to defeat the demon lord. The story follows him as he travels the world with his comrades. The game begins in 1515 according to the Imperial Calendar, and now it is 1505, also according to the Imperial Calendar. Exactly 10 years before the start of the game, our protagonist Denthalion, who is ranked 71, realizes, and the one who destroyed the protagonist's village, creating the opportunity for the game to be born, was the 72nd Lord of the Demon Dungeon, Lord Andro Malleus. Let's move on to the moment when people notice this Lord's abuse of his servants. He was beating him with his feet and hands. No one could interfere with this. He told him to shut up because he was an old cheat. Our hero realizes that he will be the first to mock him a little before he attacks the village. Lord Andromalius beat the unfortunate servant, shouting his taunts. And it happened faster than he expected, the Lord says. This moment continued as he took a glass of wine. He takes a sip and says, let's nip any seeds of anxiety in the bud in advance, raising it above him. He wants to get everyone's attention. The glass goes straight down, and it's clear that the journey will be interesting. It was much more interesting than he thought. The glass falls, breaks, and the wine spills. The text contains no errors and is correct. However, if you want to add additional context or express the idea in other words, you can reword it. The result became clear, or the result was clear. This caught Lord Andromalius's attention. He looked him straight in the eye and saw that he was a demon lord. He was angry because who had the right to interfere in this? Demonius would not tolerate this. He looked at everyone with a demonic gaze, and he saw the terrible smile of our hero. Andromalius with horns was angry with this rascal. He said to him, Why are you smiling, you rascal? At the moment the Lord approached him, our hero said to his servant, Does Andromalius have any powers that protect him? As far as I know, she answered that he had nothing of the sort. We spend most of our time in the casino. He's notorious for using his position as a demon lord to torment people. And even among the lords, it's considered an absolute disgrace. Looking at him, Denthalion realizes what he sees. This rascal is coming to him to find out what he is doing there. He looks at the Lord and his servants and thinks about the ranks of these scoundrels. But he notices his horn and realizes that it is. The woman behind him was a half-breed, and it was this Lord they were talking about. The girl is worried about her Lord and asks him, Please refrain from rash actions and conflicts between the Lords, for the demons already bring many complications. But what can become a complication for society, public law, or something else? The girl answers that this is true. Even demon lords higher than the nobility have the means to destroy the world. In addition, there are 72 of them in the world. And now there is a common law to resolve issues that arise. They use laws to deal with these issues to ensure that order is maintained. And she hopes the lord knows about them. And since common law forbids demon lords from fighting another demon, his emotions are running high now, and he starts a childish fight. For which, first of all, he will have to be punished. She stands behind him, and he says it's very funny. The moment of climax, the demon lords stand and look at each other. Andralius asks, What are you doing here? What does he answer? Why does it matter to you? He sees how he behaves and it makes him sick. Revealing his intentions, he declares that he is leaving this place because he feels like garbage. Lord Andreas is furious. He says that you just want to die. Denthalion answers the question, saying that he feels the same way. These words drive the 72nd ranked lord to madness, and he lashes out at him in a rage. The girl sees the aggression directed at her lord and realizes that she needs to intervene. The two lords rush at each other and always want to hurt each other. 
He, this lord, is so angry that his mouth is dripping with saliva, and he looks like he's ready to rush into the fight and beat him up. But our hero is standing there, not moving a muscle, because he has been warned that if he wants to hit him, he will. And suddenly the second lord realizes that he could have big consequences if he does. His fist stops right at the level of Uriah's face. He declares that there are some rather strange rumors about him. About a man of quite a noble background who mixes himself with ordinary people, believe it or not. But it's a combination of a man and a demon. It seems that this scoundrel wants to make him and the Lord lovers. He replies that he did not think he would meet such a man in such a place. Instead of striking him, he simply puts his hand on the dentillion's shoulder and smiles slyly. But the answer is a complete ignoramus and you know why? He knows that it was very close. Because Andre almost broke the law. Demon lords are forbidden to attack each other, and you should be well aware that you are a Dantalian. Andrews completely succumbed to this deliberate provocation and found himself in a situation where he wanted to strike back. He asked Dante Leon if he really thought he would fall for it, and what a vile scoundrel he was. But Lord Antalian understood. Why would he just leave now? But Andrew kept talking. I see the one who seduced the demon lord, and it was the dirty street rat Lala. Although she had very beautiful eyes, one day he smelled the oppressive stench usually associated with the lower classes, he said. He keeps asking her how she managed to seduce that idiot and make him fall in love with her. He likes her so much that he wants to try her at least once and pokes his finger into her breast. She tells him, please stop, please stop, I'm begging you. But for Andre, it didn't matter. He turns to the Tenthalian and says that the common law states, it only applies to demon lords and does not apply to other persons belonging to the lower class. He raises his fist, saying the same thing in other words. You alert our girl Lala, who looks at his actions in shock. He emphasizes that it is okay to hit others, but not demon lords, and he hits the girl hard right in the face. Everyone was shocked by this turn of events, because Lord Andreas had crossed the holy line. Andreas laughs, because he has found a vulnerability in the law that allows you to attack anyone but a demon lord, and it's absolutely wonderful, he says. He emphasizes that he is using his beloved girl and then will return her to you after he finds out if she is an unclean woman. He asks you to take care of her. All his words were aimed at making Dentalion angry and causing him psychological pain. Dentalion held his chest, restraining himself. He didn't like that sly face, but he couldn't hit him that easily. After these words, Andre was shocked that his girlfriend was using him and then returning him. The Dentalion was extremely angry. Andre was visibly abusing her to make Ventilion angry. She lay on the ground and said, You are fools, and it is all because of Dentalion. Andre said that he showed no mercy to anyone who opposed him, neither to children nor to women. Everyone standing here, kneel before me! Andre shouts. Either you all want to become like this mongrel, or he's going to force you to do it if he has to. The witches saw this and realized that this was not the case. The people were also disturbed by these words. But the Lord did not calm down. He laughed and demanded. He looked at poor unhappy Lilia. He kicked again, asserting his authority. He blurred, kicking harder and harder each time. She screamed in pain, but no one was in a hurry to help her. The Lord asked himself how he felt. Probably wonderful. Our hero stood and quietly watched all this. Andre asked, How do you feel now, Dentalion? His girlfriend was going down right in front of him, and he couldn't even say anything. Now that you all know who I am, say my name. I am the one who stands at the top of this world. I am the greatest Lord Andromalius, he exulted. But Dentalion interrupted him. She asked him, Why are you so funny, fool? It sounded funny because he was so arrogant about himself. Andromalius, why are you surprised that many people follow him? He also went on to say that Denthalion was such an unlucky man. Andromalius said that if they didn't follow him, he would just defeat them by force. Listening to this lie, our lord just smiled. I asked him, And whom have you ever defeated with your pathetic strength? Andromalius was suddenly known for saying such things in the corner. He just couldn't stand it and got angry about it. And as soon as he saw that the girl got to her feet, she got up and shook off the blows. She was covered with dirt because she had fallen. He said to her, you should not have gotten up from the ground. And from his first words, it becomes clear that he killed her girlfriend. Lala, as I always did, looked at this scoundrel with a cold look. Lala asks the scoundrel why he's looking at her like that. But she attacks him with her fists, hits him in the face, and says, How can you, mongrel, distract me? But when he hit her, he noticed, Perhaps you meant something was wrong with her. She continued to look at him coldly. He noticed how, by hitting her, she had gained courage. How could she, a mere insect, kneel before him? Everyone on the track watched in fear as he mocked the girl. Lord said, No one will kneel before such a miserable rascal. The girl named Lala is the same girl who has been living in the slums since she was a child. So she is used to being beaten. Andromalius's tiered blows cannot hurt her. This statement is rude and unacceptable. When it comes to correcting aggressive or obscene phrases, it is not always possible to correct them to an acceptable form. 
as the very essence of such expressions may contradict the norms of decency and the law. However, to show respect for others, you can rephrase such a phrase in a more civilized way. For example, I am very angry with you right now. Like a demon lord, like a king in this world. You're an impudent girl who is annoying with your eyes. The hand reaches for the dagger, and our master says he will borrow the knife for a while. The girl stands on her feet. Andri's hand reaches out to hit the girl. But when I hit her, she doesn't even flinch. Who is this miserable mongrel dog that looks at him with disdain, as if he were a priceless piece of meat? His eyes are burning with rage, as if he is about to explode. From this tension, he makes the decision to kill it. But suddenly something else catches his attention, and he looks away. Just then, a dentillion slashes a dagger past his face, slicing his eyeball open, making everything bleed. Everyone looks at this and, fascinated, does not understand why he did it. Lord Andreas takes hold of his eyes and screams, My eyes, my eyes, my eyes! Lord Denthalion says, You don't need your eyes because they can't see clearly what's going on. He's a very strange character, and there is no need to fight him. Lala turns to him and says, Your Highness, what have you done? Don't you realize what this means? He comes up to her, takes her by the sides and says, How do you feel, Lali? At this moment, she feels care and love from him. He holds her head and says, I know she is in his heart. He takes her hand and says, Give me your other hand. He says it sweetly. I want to give you this on the occasion of a real holiday. But I will give you a gift while you are shining the most beautiful. At that moment, Lala was bruised and looked particularly depressed. He puts the ring on her hand, and she looks at it in awe. He lifts her hand and says, Don't say anything now, just keep quiet and watch. He addresses all the people in the city and says that he is the 71st Lord Denthalion. This person stepped on his foot. He holds an engagement ring for this girl. He loves her. Even if you have a completely different status, it doesn't matter. Because it won't stop them from being together. People who watched this were just amazed by his words that he loves this girl. I have nothing against you, Andromalius. But this man hit a person he loves very much. Now he is asking everyone if it is possible to forgive such a scoundrel and such an injustice. He wants to do everything possible to make sure that no trace of him remains. Lord Anthalion emphasizes that he certainly cannot afford to miss this opportunity, even if he is a demon lord. And now it is time for the trial. When a loud sound was heard, they couldn't believe that he had really broken the law of demons. Sir, only for the sake of my beloved. But it's not over yet. Turning to Lala, our host told her, to just watch and enjoy what was happening, because the continuation of the performance promised to be no less exciting. The meeting promised to be no less interesting. So, addressing the audience once again, Dantalian asked how much time they intended to devote to the event. To endure and obey such an unjust demon lord? He asked loudly. Do they really agree with such an attitude towards them? Is this justice? Is there an even greater scoundrel in this world than this one? And shouldn't he be brought to justice? Andrus was the one whose fate was being determined right now. Although perhaps everything had been decided from the moment he decided to oppose our hero. It didn't matter now. As the 72nd ranked demon lord was desperate, he shouted, ordering everyone to shut up and listen to him. Everyone shut up and listened to him. He then turned to Dantalus, the one who was now accusing him, and said that they, that they were only one rank apart, and that he was just a little rascal who dared to break the law. By attacking him, he actually signed his own death warrant. Andromachaeus fell into a frenzy again. There were endless screams. Dantalion had broken the law and must die. The gathered crowd looked on with hostility. It was obvious that this madman had trapped himself. Even his threats that he would kill anyone who did not listen to him were nothing more than empty talk. Everyone realized this, and no one was afraid of him anymore. Andre called Danilin and told him that he had no right to judge him, but all he heard in response was laughter. Our MC asked if he was still that arrogant. He was arrogant even when he did something so horrible that it immediately prompted him to object, but Dantalion did not give him the opportunity. Raising his hand in the air, he addressed the people of Niflheim. In a loud voice, he declared that in the name of the demon lord he would execute the judgment of this man. But he was not going to judge him himself. He was leaving the sentence to the audience. The audience, who had witnessed everything Andromachaeus had done, could decide for themselves. He added that it was thanks to people that they became demon lords, and they were able to live to this day. However, this guy was born a demon lord, and initially abused the power he was given, instead of fulfilling his duties as a demon lord. He spent his time going to bars and gambling in casinos to no avail. But the worst part was that he got the power by accident. He had gotten the power by accident, and he dared to bully. What kind of demon lord would treat the weak like that? That he is not worthy of this title, this rank. Every word of our hero hit the mark. In the end, every word of our hero's speech resonated in the hearts of everyone present. 
he said Dalian wanted to hear what others thought about it, so he asked if they thought he deserved it. Life dictates the time when we should rise up and confront the enemy, the time to become heroes, who do it for the sake of their future and the future of their children. Andri, who had been listening all this time, shouted irritably for the girl to be quiet. To silence the latter, he angrily began to urge the audience to immediately grab our microphone. However, his words already sounded like despair and panic. The reason for this was not only that, his frustration was not only that no one supported him or listened to him, but also that he was alone. No one supported him or listened to him. He had long since become a nobody to everyone. And the reason for this was that he did not notice anything, and our hero was well aware of this. Andromeda did not want to admit it and just kept screaming. He didn't see anything, so he couldn't know who killed him. Blinded by the Andromic, he was even less able to resist than usual due to a minor injury. However, he did not have to scream for long, because the next moment a blade was plunged into his back. Feeling a sharp pain, Andromeda asked in a less brave voice who had attacked him. However, as he expected, he received no answer. Now he was completely defenseless. The only thing he could do was to let out another barrage of curses and threats. However, he was stopping Dantalian, who put his hand on his shoulder and leaning towards the once proud demon lord, he said, I am grateful for his cooperation, because it was thanks to him that everything went according to plan. Not understanding the meaning of his words, Andre asked. Andrus became interested in the meaning of his words and asked what he was talking about. But after a moment, his attention shifted to something else. His attention shifted to a different sound. Several voices were constantly repeating only one phrase. Kill. Andri Malyesh's first thought was that these words were not about him, but about someone else, and he tried to convince himself of this. Feeling that the situation called for action, he started shouting at them, but he made a mistake and realized it when the angry voices behind him, even Andromeda's, subsided. The voices behind him had died down, even Andromache realized. Laughing hysterically, he asked the crowd, Is this serious? Serious about killing him and getting nothing in return? He began to panic and begged them to stop. But it seems that all efforts were in vain. It was already too far when at the same time our main character returned to his friends. He didn't feel bad about Andromalius, because he got what he deserved. It was a classic example of deserved karma. Nothing more to add, I leave the execution of the sentence to the community. Dalian's message to the residents of Neheim was as follows. It is time to return everything you heard when you left. Only Andri Malyesh's desperate and painful cry for help indicated an undeniable victory. But he barely had time to get his hands dirty. Without even getting his hands dirty, Dantelin retreated to a quieter place. Dantelin apologized for what happened, saying that he was very tired. Our hero offered to postpone dinner until next time. They told him not to worry about them and to go get some rest. They also added that they would walk him to the hotel. But suddenly, our hero interrupted them, asking if anyone from their group was missing. Wasn't someone from their group missing? Hearing this, one of the witches quickly turned around to check his words. Just as Dantalian had said, one of the witches was indeed missing, and that witch was Beatrice, as evidenced by the reaction of one of the sisters. It was not the first time that one of the sisters had such a reaction. The witch immediately began to apologize to Dantalian, saying that her sister was in the habit of going away. Hearing this, our hero suspected something, but without focusing on it. Without focusing on it, he replied that everything was fine. The main thing was, he had one more request for them. Meanwhile, Beatrice, who had disappeared, was amazed at what she saw. She never expected to see such an impressive show. She knew from the Dantalians that this was only the beginning. So she was looking forward to the next show, which promised to be interesting. The evening streets of Niflheim were particularly beautiful, impressive, and peaceful. Even though the number of demon lords per square meter was much higher than usual due to the approach of Walpurgis Night, the headquarters of the Kusa firm, unlike the rest of the city, was surrounded by a gloomy atmosphere and fog, as one would expect from a real lair. Waiting to meet a real vampire in his own lair, which was located in the headquarters, Thoral walked back and forth in search of his master. Because tomorrow was the night of Walpurgis, Thoral was very worried because he hadn't been able to contact Mr. Ivar for a week and hoped to find him. For a whole week he had been hoping to find him, and today he went to the gate of his office and called out to Mr. Ivar. There she was. Silence in response, then TL decided to enter and ask again if Sir Ivar had returned. The ancient vampire's office was the same as always. As expected, the ancient vampire's office was very unusual. Instead of tables and cabinets with documents and books, there were numbered coffins. Looking around, TL realized that his master had not yet returned, and asked himself where he could have been all this time. 
This time he didn't have to think long, because a whistle flying overhead quickly caught his attention. In a moment, a witch girl with bright green eyes appeared in the window. She looked at TL carefully and asked him if he had been watching the company well and diligently. And then she deftly jumped down to one of the coffins. At one of the coffins, Toll immediately recognized her and was not surprised to see her there. He had only one question for her. Where was she? Well, not her, but him. Mr. Ivar. It was him. He, however, as it turned out, played a different role. He went to see with his own eyes Lapis and Dalian, where he played the role of a witch. The witch sang beautifully with everyone, and even carried Liapis on her broomstick, who had no idea who he was flying with. She also accompanied them on their walks around the city, and listened carefully to their every word. And now she could say with certainty, he could confidently say that he had gotten a good look at this charming couple, although he was a little shocked and didn't understand how, all of which came out in his manic laughter. I didn't understand how he managed to do it. However, I quickly overcame my surprise and asked what my host had managed to find out. Unfortunately, things were not going too well in this regard, so I could not learn anything new from them, because they did not say anything about the plague. But instead, Mr. Ivar noticed something very interesting on Hemmer's Square and eagerly asked, as soon as Ivar heard the news, instead of answering, he laughed strangely, and replied that he must have underestimated Denton. However, it didn't matter, because the idiot was still confused about love and was ready to do anything for his beloved, is ready to do anything for his beloved. And that means that his main weakness is his fear of it. If possible, Avar asked TL to inform him of any changes in the situation with Lady Payon. Since it was expected that Lady Payon would be ready to support them, she assured TL of her readiness. Igvar just laughed his sinister laugh and assured her that he would spare no effort or means to help them. He was completely satisfied with this agreement. And then he disappeared into the coffin. The lid closed with a loud bang. Immediately flames broke out. They rose to the ceiling and began to spread. It reached the ceiling and began to move from one coffin to another. So it went from the thirteenth coffin to the first, where it stopped. It stopped right in front of the frightened eyes, and the pale hand of an old man appeared from the first coffin. From there, Mr. Ivar came out. Mr. Ivar appeared in his usual form. His first order to Thoral was to deliver the message word for word, as he would have said it to the cashier. His ominous laugh echoed through the room, and he was full of anticipation for the day ahead. He couldn't help but notice that he hadn't looked forward to the next day with such anticipation for centuries. He was determined to pay back the insolence, to pay them back for their insolence with interest. They had better be ready for it. 24 hours after the Andromeda incident, on the day of Andromeda, Valperusa, a knight, arrived at the square in front of the castle, which was busier than usual. Rows of knights in armor stood on both sides of the red carpet. I could tell that they were finally waiting for the first demon lords to arrive. The first of them began to arrive, and everyone else was ordered to disperse. All the guests froze in anticipation of who would be the first to arrive. The first carriage arrived. The servants immediately lined up on both sides of it and bowed with respect. The lady who got out thanked everyone for the warm welcome. It was her arrival that the servants were looking forward to the most. They were most looking forward to seeing the piggy bank. A corrected and improved sentence might look like this. As soon as she got out of the carriage, she asked the first servant if all the preparations she and Ivar had agreed upon were complete. The servant assured her that they were. Everything was ready, and everything went smoothly. The cashier was happy to hear this, because she likes things to go according to plan. But one thing caught her attention. She didn't see any familiar faces around, so she assumed she was too early. The morning silence might have seemed peaceful, but a sudden shout at her back quickly dispelled all doubts. Another demon lord had arrived, and his coachman was screaming at the top of his lungs. To make way for everyone, Lady Cashier, I realized almost immediately who had arrived. A black carriage. The black horses were also riding very fast. The guests who had gathered barely had time to run away to save themselves. Finally, the carriage stopped, and before the dust could settle, the carriage's passenger threw open the door with just one kick. Instead, her eyes blazed with anger and rage. She shouted loudly across the square that her butt hurt after sitting for a long time. However, she didn't stop there. She didn't like everything she said. She claimed that everything around her smelled like droppings, like a devil. This little lady had a difficult temper for a reason. She was the eighth-ranked demon lord. Her name was Barbados, and she was the goddess of black magic and disease. As soon as she saw Miss Payon, she immediately became angry and gnashed her teeth. Their feud was obvious and had probably been going on for years because as soon as their eyes met, you could feel the tension. 
Barbados did not miss the opportunity to call her rival a noble woman of easy virtue when their paths crossed, and Lady Payon did not react. I couldn't help but give Barbados an angry look, and then told her in a loud voice that her taste remained as questionable as ever. Barbados replied that she didn't care about the taste advice of a person who had slept with a centaur and that she considered herself too liberated. The payer just snorted contemptuously and asked, Indeed, such behavior in a situation where you need to start acting like an adult is immature. But then Riley added, With a figure like Barbados's, it's not going to be easy for her, and she's probably already gone through a rough patch in finding a lover, right? That means she'll probably stay a girl forever. Finally, the cashier asked the irritated Barbados if he should stop taking his inferiority complex out on others. When she heard that someone had dared to touch her sore spot and make a joke about her childish appearance, she simply exploded with anger. She could not believe that someone dared. In response, she threatened to cut off that overhanging lump of fat. She cut off that hanging mass of fat that was securely holding onto Pimone. And right there, right then, there was silence. No one dared to say a word for fear of being caught between two fires. Fortunately, the next carriage arrived, and everyone paid attention to it. The next demon. The master arrived, and everyone was asked to step back. Barbados looked angrily at the immortal daredevil who had dared. As it turned out, our MC Dental stepped in to break up their quarrel. Before getting out of the carriage, he asked Lala if she was okay, and offered to hold her hand. However, she refused the offer, saying that it was not necessary. When they got out, from the carriage, all the guests watched them, mouths agape in amazement, and could not believe that this was the same Dantalian about whom they had heard rumors. Lala looked around, scrutinizing the guests, especially the furious Barbados who could not calm down. Lala wanted to introduce Dantalian to everyone. However, he stopped her, assuring her that he knew them. And moreover, it seemed that everyone here was absolutely sure who they were. So Dantalion, despite the angry or curious looks that were thrown at them, advised Lala not to be afraid and to go ahead with confidence. Now let's fast forward 30 minutes to when Denton and Lala arrived in Valisken. They were in a carriage, and Lala, in her carriage, Lala was assuring Dantalian that after everything that had happened, she could not go with him. Dantalian felt quite calm and could not believe his ears as he listened to her words. Why was she nervous? It was not like her at all. Besides, there was a ball to be held after the meeting which, of course, our leader was not happy about. But it would be even worse if Lala didn't come, because then he would be left without a partner. She wants him to go there alone, but Lala doesn't seem to like it very much. She still didn't like the idea, and she stared at Dantalian with unblinking eyes. Seeing her hurt look, he asked her what was wrong. Is it still because of what happened yesterday? He wondered. Why is she still angry when she remembers what happened? Yesterday, Dantalian had stood up for her and told her in front of everyone that he loved her, even though he had made excuses, that he had no other choice, and that it was the only way. She had no other choice. It was the only way to solve everything. Lapis couldn't stop thinking about that moment and felt very ashamed. Dantalus was still waiting for her answer. Finally, she gathered her thoughts and replied that he was wrong, and she was not at all worried about what he had said. Not for anything he said or did, but just for the sake of Nightwall Purgis who usually gathered demon lords and some high-ranking demons. High-ranking demons attend these events, and for a half-breed of such low origin as her to be present in such a place is too much. A lot of chutzpah. Denton was surprised that she still cared about such trifles, but he had one. He officially announced Lapis as his fiance GC and advised her not to be afraid and to stay by his side to fix the situation. It's safe to say that they are the most talked-about couple in the world, so it would be inappropriate to disappoint those who have been waiting for so long. Having disappointed those who had been looking forward to seeing them, Lala remained silent and swallowed nervously. She blushed again. She still couldn't stop thinking about that strange boy, how she had felt about him after they had spent some time together. What was going on in his head? Seriously, what is this guy thinking about? Until yesterday, she thought it was all about love. Until yesterday, she thought. The whole lover thing was just an excuse to borrow money, and then it turned out he was just using her to get away with it. I'd thought he was just using it to avoid suspicion, but it seemed... It wasn't like that. It was different. But he continued to play his own games. However, the upcoming meeting worried her the most, because a lot depended on how it went. One wrong word could make a big difference, and the war could start even because of a word. War could break out over the smallest thing. What happens there can affect the lives of tens or hundreds of people. Thousands of people were present. The topic of the meeting was the plague, 
and yesterday's incident would not go unnoticed either, so she could not ignore it. She had to understand how he could remain so relaxed, calm, and collected. Did he... He really had a plan to solve everything as efficiently as possible. Finally they arrived at the castle. The Dentalian instantly tensed up and got ready for action, while Lala tried to warn him about it. Lala tried to warn him about it. She watched what was happening outside and tried to prevent it. He was already up, a strange smile on his face. The first to get out of the carriage was Lala, whom she tried to stop, asking him to wait for her, so that she could go out first, as a maid should. But she failed, because Dantalion, being a true gentleman, held out his hand to her and suggested that she appear at the meeting in proper attire. Seeing her hesitation, he again invited her to take his hand and go to the meeting. He held out his hand to go to the meeting but Lala was frozen in place and did not know how to react. In the end she decided to just walk past him, leaving him standing there with his hand outstretched like an idiot. Thank you. She wasn't ready for that, Dantalion. Of course he was a little upset at the cold shoulder but he and Lala, the demon lords who were filled with anger, could not bear the thought of Lala. Seeing the tense atmosphere, she tried to warn him about those who had already arrived, but her words went unheeded. The angry glances of the two angry ladies were directed at Delani. They were full of anger, but he was not at all confused. Confused, but with a confident gait, he walked straight toward them. Lapis had no choice but to follow him. In the midst of the silence, bowing and greeting, he asked, Are these Lady Payman and Lady Barbados? And then he introduced himself. The 71st ranked Demon Lord Denton. Such audacity almost prompted Barbados to accuse him of insolence. Because how dare such low-ranking trash address her in such a manner? And although she was in a very bad mood right now, she could barely restrain herself from hurting someone. After hearing all this, Dantan bowed a little deeper and said that he understood the situation and apologized for his behavior. He explained his behavior by saying that he was still young, in the lady's opinion, and had never met such wonderful people as Lady Barbados and Lady Payman in his life. Barbados and the Lady Cashier stood so close that he could not pass them without saying hello. In parting, he said that, Barbados sincerely apologized, but he didn't even know how to react, because usually after he yells at someone, when they bumped into someone, they usually ran away quickly, with their pants wet but keeping their pride. However, this guy was different. And in the end, she just sighed in frustration and told Dantalian that he could stop making excuses because nothing bad happened. Lapis was surprised by this behavior, because who would have thought that the scary and notoriously bad-tempered Barbados would behave like this? She quickly calmed down, just turned around and walked further along the red carpet to the castle, although she looked calm on the outside. On the outside, she seemed calm. However, inside, she had a lot of questions. How did this guy, a low-level demon lord, dare to come near where she and Payman were? He didn't look scared at all. On the contrary, he seemed very confident. Smiling confidently and mysteriously, she summarized. That's what Dantalion was like. All her thoughts were now about him. She was no longer interested in payment at all. Lady Payman merely gave her a contemptuous glance and then turned to, noting how irritating Barbados had always been, Lady Payman said politely, as always she hoped this would not offend him, but she had heard that it did not. She had heard so much about him, Mr. Dantalion. Our chief physician was well aware that good manners and ambiguous phrases sometimes hide something else. Sometimes they conceal a much greater danger than direct threats. So he was in no hurry to answer and preferred to remain silent. The lady cashier approached the girl with the assumption that she was standing by the dentist's window for a reason. When the girl heard that she was being addressed, she responded. She heard herself being addressed, immediately bowed in respect and replied that she was in the service of a lord. Dentani, whose name is Lapis Lazuli, liked her answer but said she shouldn't behave badly. Still, she said that she shouldn't act so formal because everything was fine and everyone here was a good friend. Looking at her carefully, I realized that I could not trust a word she said. Looking at her concentrated face, Lady Payman, he just laughed and came closer to get a better look at her face. She could not help but notice how young and beautiful it was. Young and beautiful it was at the moment when Dantalian decided to intervene. He assured her that what she was saying was far from the truth, because everyone knows that no one can. The truth, because everyone knows that no one dares to compete with her own beauty. Mrs. Platnikova was even surprised at how well he said it. He said it well, and she even added that if you look at him closely, he is also a very handsome young man, a Dantalian. He replied that he was very grateful for such praise from the cashier herself. Finally, she also got ready to go to the castle. She was on her way to the castle, but as she passed our MC, she whispered to him that she would like to have one more long conversation with him. And now she said goodbye to him, assuring him that they would meet again later, and left with her servants.
Leaving Denton and Lapis alone, our MC thought it was quite interesting to talk to her. He actually invited Lala to come with him. Only now I realize that it was all a well-acted play. She stared at him indignantly. Then Denton asked her, 